Committee on Health and Social Development. Today is Friday, October 28th. Uh, this is our 9 a.m. meeting, and uh, I'd like to uh, welcome all the members here today for the committee. We have Zach Bell, uh, Sydney McEwen, Rob Henderson, Michelle Beaton, and Carla Bernard, and uh, visiting MLAs to the committee. Thank you for coming. Trish Altez, Peter Bevenbaker, and Hannah Bell. Uh, so we have a busy day today. We have two meetings scheduled, so one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So we have two different different organizations here today. So what we're going to do is uh, for the committee members, we're going to uh, listen to both presentations and I'll, I'll maybe entertain a couple of clarification questions uh, and then afterwards we'll, we'll open the floor up to, to, to uh, questions at that time if that's okay by committee members. So take your notes and ask your clarification questions but we're just trying to maximize the amount of time we have for questions um, and we have a hard uh, uh, 12 p.m. Uh, kind of cut off for a lot of uh, different questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it over to our, our, our well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it over to everybody to, to introduce themselves for Hansard. So just one at a time you can introduce yourself and then I'll pass it over to you, Tanya, because I, I do believe you're going first. Okay, so I'll, I'll pass it over to our guests. Great. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Patrick Davis, uh, Director of uh, Planning, Policy and Innovation with Social Development and Housing. Uh, Jason Doyle, uh, Director of Housing with Social Development and Housing. Dave Rossiter, Provincial Fire Marshal. Sally Ripley, Director of Social Programs. Great. And Tanya Mullally, I'm the Acting Director for Public Safety, responsible for EMO. And I guess I'll launch yes, right into that you. from there. So thank you very much for uh, for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to try and keep this clean, concise, and, and quick for you, but certainly uh, making those notes and if there's anything clarifying that you need from me just please uh, feel free to do that. Um, so just a quick uh, overview of kind of what we're going to present to you uh, this morning is um, we're going to try to give you a bit of a picture of what EMO does, a little bit of concept of operations uh, that we always try to provide uh, just to provide some context of what we do so that that might actually uh, provide some uh, answers to some potential questions. Uh, we're going to speak to some of the Fiona activities that we did both in preparedness and in response. I'm going to hand it over to our fire marshal to offer a little bit of what he's seen on the front lines from uh, the fire marshal's office and the fire service, uh, both in preparedness and response activities, and then I'll wrap it up with some just a couple of quick notes on our recovery actions from, from our perspective. So um, starting with just our PEI uh, mandate, um, Always a good thing to kind of just understand our scope uh, is to provide the province with uh, kind of a provincial emergency management program uh, to protect people, property, and the environment. And we always kind of tag in economy when we talk about these things uh, in response to a disaster or an emergency. Um, Basically, our whole role is around uh, coordinating, managing uh, provincial government departments and agencies so that we kind of have a unified approach uh, in response to any type of event. I will note that the, I was here uh, a couple of years ago, um, not in this space, but at standing committee at this group uh, for Dorian, but it was one year post Dorian. So I had a lot more probably to offer in regards to recovery, lessons learned, that type of thing. Um, for us today, we're just barely a month out. We are still activated in our operations center uh, for recovery activities, so we're just starting to scope out what our uh, lessons, and we're really calling them lessons identified at this point, because until they're really learned, um, you know, and <coughs> embedded into our activation and operations is when we kind of change that language. Um, so first, really quickly, just about our concept of operations. So I should note that within our Emergency Operations Center, or for EMO, this is standard practice within emergency management across the country, and I'll even say holistically within emergency management. Um, so we talk about preparedness. Um, that's really where we live, probably 95% of our time. Um, Typically, uh, not necessarily in the last couple of years. We've lived in response a little bit too much. Um, but preparedness is basically where we try to engage with community partner agencies, departments, uh, the whole community, um, to basically ensure that there's some level of preparedness, or at least that we can understand the level of preparedness so that we have a better understanding of what response and recovery looks like. Um, so. Um, 
you know, when we talk about, I have whole of society, I just want to make note to that piece. Um, whole of society is a reference um, within the UN, United Nations, um, <coughs> Sendai framework for the disaster risk reduction that was developed in 2015. And what they suggest is that a whole of society, everybody has a role when it comes to preparedness, um, to whatever scope and capability an individual agency can have. Um, we want to encourage and embrace that and bolster where we can. So, um, you know, government has a role, but so do businesses, community-based organizations, individuals. We all have a role to play within uh, preparedness. So uh, we really strongly push that and that we understand and work together toward that. Um, activation levels is just something that you'll hear me speak to in regards to our the response and the preparedness activities. We have three activation levels within our operation center, noting that, that we share that within Atlantic Canada. Uh, we all use the same activation level, so we know when we talk to each other what each other is doing. So activation level number one is just an enhanced monitoring. We see something that potentially could make impact to PEI, so we're kind of doing what we call leaning forward a little bit and talking to people, uh, engaging with our partners, uh, getting ourselves ready uh, for a potential um, event. Um, level two is a partial activation. It just means we're kind of hand selecting our agencies saying we want you to come in and we want you to formally report. Level three um, is basically where it's all hands on deck. Everybody is in the space. So for Fiona, we actually work through all three of those, and then we're starting to back off. We move from three, now we're at level two, but in a recovery phase. Um, Coordination and decision making, and I'll say situational awareness and information uh, sharing are all kind of three concepts of operations that we, we work kind of holistically and in collaboration with all our agencies. Um, any decision that we, uh, I shouldn't say any decision, but most of the decisions that we do are done as a whole. So our provincial operations center team that I'll speak to in a couple of seconds, um, they're the experts. Our job as EMO is to coordinate and manage that and make sure that everybody's closing loops, uh, that people are working effectively together, um, and that where they uh, can leverage each other as opposed to working in individual silos, we push people together, make sure that they're working effectively together. Um, our single piece of, of authority, I would say, is our Emergency Measures Act um, that outlines kind of what our scope is, what our responsibilities, our ministers, um, and then it does speak a little bit in regards to a state of emergency and what those effects um, and what that uh, allows us to do. The last piece is on the provincial EOC team membership. So that is a collective group of approximately 60 agencies. Um, includes every single government department. Um, it includes many federal agencies like the Canadian Armed Forces who actually are embedded into our, our office space. They, we have a, a staff person there that works there 100% of the time. Um, we also have folks like Red Cross, Maritime Electric, Bell, all the telecommunication um, companies. They all are part of our team. So anytime we activate, anything that we share in information gets sent out to every single one of these agencies. There's usually one or two reps from each of those agencies. And then they then share all their that information that we collect and provide. Um, they push it out through within their agencies and their stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> The last little piece I'll say just on concept of operations is on uh, our after action process. That is a concept within emergency management in regards to continuous improvement. We're always asking ourselves, what did we do yesterday really well? Uh, what did we do that we need some work on or need to tighten up or improve on? Um, so we're asking ourselves every day that, but we would do this after every even after every training session that we deliver, every exercise that we deliver, uh, and every event that we do, we always do an after action informally uh, within our operations team. Uh, even with our EMO staff, we'll have a little, a smaller huddle, um, but there will be the intention of a much larger, um, like we did in Dorian, but again, Dorian was very focused uh, into our EMO operations, so I think the, there is a benefit uh, to doing a much uh, larger one. Um, very quickly, I spoke a little bit about this already, about the purpose of the EOC team. Uh, these are kind of what our role in, in uh, EMO and our responsibilities is to coordinate and determine uh, provincial priorities for resource <coughs> management and strategic decision making. So again, remembering that EMO is, we're, we're just, 
um, were the, the coach to that, if I could use a sports analogy. I'm not a sports person, but um, that we basically just kind of uh, even quarterback it, um, navigate people through the process. Um, but we take all the information that comes in from all the agencies, and we uh, ask them questions, ask them how to do it, what do they need, and we make sure that it gets uh, a decision make, uh, made at the end of it. We coordinate public information, so we would have communication staff that would be in our EOC, and typically uh, when we activate, uh, all those press releases and um, information sharing gets vetted through our office uh, first um, before it's pushed out, and we really want to streamline uh, information being sent out to individuals that it is aligned with our priorities um, to make sure that there's not um, multiple messages being sent out to public that might distract them from the critical life saving stuff. So we try to keep it streamlined that way. Coordinate all agencies and departments um, to limit du the duplication of effort and alignment objectives. And what I mean there is really just around removing any potential silo of people doing great work in one particular area, but missing not sharing that information with somebody else. So that's what our environment allows, is that in this one large space, people are working very collaboratively lead together. Um, assistance support municipalities is a one big piece, uh, trying to, to uh, reach into municipalities, finding what they need. Uh, but not only municipalities, but also with all of our um, infrastructure partners, all of our partner agencies, we're reaching into them saying, what do you need? Uh, is there anything that we can be uh, helpful? Is there a, a department or something that needs to be leveraged? Uh, whatever that looks like. Um, Provide the provincial uh, picture of impact. Um, I often use this analogy is that that's one of our biggest jobs is to paint the provincial picture of what has happened out there. And we do that. We physically, as EMO, don't go out there. We're a very small staff of four people um, and plus myself. So we don't have that capability to do that. Um, but we rely on all the partner agencies to do that. And you know, one of the pieces that uh, the fire marshal will speak to shortly will be he, his eyes of the over 1,000 members of the fire service that were eyes into, um, into the operation center for us. Request federal or provincial territorial assistance. So that is a mechanism that our uh, office conducts is that if there's a request for federal assistance, it must come through our office, through our minister to the federal minister of public safety. Um, that is just the protocol and the practice that's done that way. But also we have capability to reach to every other province and territory within Canada. Um, I'll speak to that probably in a few seconds. Um, and then we also have a capability to reach into our New England states. We have an MOU with our, we call them the International Emergency Management Group, uh, so that we can uh, affect that request as well. Last one is make recommendations on um, on chain, um, policies, anything that is not part of our routine business, such as uh, requesting activation of the Provincial Disaster Financial Assistance Program. So that would be a request uh, to Cabinet to approve that piece. Are we good? No questions so far? Um, the next piece, um, again, just pause, tell me to pause if I need to. Uh, next piece is just a little bit about critical infrastructure. You often, probably over the last months plus spoke about a lot of critical infrastructure, CI that we call it. Um, it's just a generic term that just I reference here is that it's actually nationally defined and it is nationally defined and used the same in every single province and territory. These are the 10 <coughs> set, <coughs> sorry, the 10 sectors that it's broken down into. It, it doesn't really change uh, much of, it's just, it's just the grouping of what they look like. And the definition that it states is that it's not just a building, it could be a system, it could be a network, it could be a service, whatever it is, but it's around the criticality of does it have a serious impact to health, safety, security, economic well-being, and effective functioning of citizens and governments. That's what kind of captures into CI, so that's just for when we talk about it, that's kind of what we're looking for. Um, I guess I should also just speak to, I guess, the, the approach to prioritization when we often spoke about, um, you know, we're prioritizing our CI partners or, you know, where power is going to be restored, that type of thing. Um, it's a tough and tricky balance to do. There is no fine science around it. If I could say it is done on the daily, sometimes on the hourly, depending on things, how they change. What we look uh, within our shop, we are always prioritizing life safety. 
over uh, incident stabilization or getting things back to normal than uh, property and the environment as last. So life safety always trumps everything else in our shop. Um, so when we look at critical infrastructure and power restoration, we're providing on the daily um, information of these are the sites that are life safety impacted. Um, and then we leave that decision to our maritime electric partners uh, to determine how to get that on in the most efficient way and the most safe way. So uh, we provide the listing of what we think is important with collaboration from all the agencies around the table. So <clears throat> Fiona preparedness um, for us uh, started on September 21st, noting that week, that Monday, we probably would have been started uh, one day sooner, but that Monday was the Queen's funeral. Uh, so that kind of uh, delayed us a little bit. Um, but we activated to a level one, which we would do standardly for any uh, kind of severe weather event. Um, so on September 21st, we started asking our uh, Provincial Operations Center team. We sent out an official notification and asked them to start reporting any potential concerns and uh, advising us on their preparedness activities. Uh, the following day, uh, we started with our daily press conferences, with our daily, um, daily briefings with the Canadian Hurricane Center, which we do as a standard practice with all of the Atlantic EMOs. We started pushing out as much social media press releases that we could, could do, uh, reached into all our municipalities to confirm that they were following weather forecasts, that they were you know, in checking on their preparedness and what they were doing, asking what they were doing in regards to reception centers. We updated a lot of our, our web tools that we have, our PEI storm response page, making sure all the data was accurate, um, and then as well, uh, 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 a piece of follow-up from Dorian uh, was a damage reporting and a self-assessment tool that we created. So we had it kind of sitting in the wings, just waiting for an event. Um, and just prior to Fiona, we just had to update those with kind of the terminology of the, the current storm. Uh, so we were doing those in the three days in advance. Um, that was just in the three days advance. There's significant work that we've done in the past three, three years from uh, Fiona. Um, that's a longer page, so I'm gonna probably skim, uh, not get into that detail, but I can speak to it later if people uh, want to have some conversations around that. So these are the impacts in this, um, Obviously, there was a lot more, but these were kind of the highlights. Um, you know, 21 days, our provincial operations center was activated at either a level two or three. Um, again, <coughs> spoke to what those what those meant. At peak, a majority of the province, or I think um, it would be fair to say, 100% uh, at one point of the island was the power. I couldn't tell you that would be a maritime electric to tell you how long that uh, actually 100% outage was. Um, it certainly impacted landlines, cell towers, um, and that was as a relation to power loss on those cell sites. Um, public information was huge for us. Um, it's, we spent an awful lot of time uh, trying to uh, share the information, noting um, without power how people were going to receive those messages was always a challenge. Um, daily municipal updates and reach out. We did, um, again, Hurricane Teddy, that never became a hurricane um, at all, but we had did a lot of prep work for that. And one of the things that we developed was an information sharing package and practice um, of how do we get information to municipalities so that they can then ensure that that information is shared with residents. Uh, so we did that in advance, had documents pre-printed and uh, positioned to send out through either uh, staff, volunteers, whatever um, it was that we could share that and have that expedited. Um, highway clearing, of course, was transportation. We're doing significant work. Power and fuel was um, a significant challenge. Fuel for the first four days, probably, and then power continued for um, another 21 days there. Um, Department of Transportation, you know, the significant impacts of, of the water. Um, I always say water always wins, and in this Fiona, certainly um, you can see some of the damage that it was quite extensive. Um, I, the last three bullets I, I, I bolded for significance, uh, for us anyway. Uh, two alert ready messages were uh, distributed, which is a very significant event because there is very specific criteria that needs to be met to do that. And we issued two in about a 14 hour uh, time frame from Friday night to Saturday morning. Um, the picture on the screen there is the shot from the Friday night one. 
we had submitted two RFAs, or requests for assistance, to the federal government, um, which ended up with our military resources, um, and the activation of EMMA, and EMMA is that uh, agreement that we have with our provinces and territories. Um, so I'm going to just take a pause and hand it over to our fire marshal for a couple of notes on his. Did you want me to Perfect. stop there? Well, just, uh, is there any uh, quick, quick clarification questions? Is everybody okay to move on? Does everybody have their information? Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Tanya. Okay, I'll be, uh, I'll be quick. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'll just go over the mandate of our office. Uh, I'm sure most of you know we're, we're kind of like Tanya's office. We're very small. There's only four of us, myself and three deputies. Uh, we promote basically fire safety throughout the province through inspections on facilities. Uh, we do it through fire investigations. We do it through public education when we can. And we also do it through the plan review process on the uh, building permit process. <clears throat> the, uh, the code enforcement part of it we do is mainly through the NFPA codes and standards, but also through the National Fire Code as well. We provide leadership to 35 volunteer fire departments. And when I say volunteer fire departments, they are all volunteer. The exception of the city of Charlotte Station 1 has a handful of career firefighters. But the vast majority of them on the island are our volunteer. And that's over 1,000. Usually hovers between 1,000 and 1,100, give or take, at any, any particular time. And I mentioned about the career firefighters there at Station, station 1 down here in Kent Street. We also liaise very closely with the PEI Firefighters Association. Uh, they operate the PEI Fire School, but they also, they are the main body or association of fire services across the island. And as well, we administer the Fire Prevention Act. <clears throat> so when you look at the preparedness that we had uh, prior to this storm, uh, we had one staff person in the PEOC on a daily basis leading up to it. Uh, we had made contact with the fire chiefs on a fairly regular basis, both before the storm, during, and after. Um, and we participated daily in the EMO briefings. Our typical day started with the information sharing meeting uh, at 8 o'clock every morning because that usually dictated what our day was going to be. A lot of the time we had a plan, and a lot of the time that plan went out the window because of events that would come up. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later in the questions. Uh, so we made sure that the fire departments received notices, especially on where to report damage, because they were the eyes and the ears on the ground. Like I said, I have a staff four. That means I can put one in each county and one in the capital. That's not going to get around too, too easy. But when I have 35 fire stations, and believe me, they were all active from zero minute of this storm. And I can't really stress this enough. Like from 12 o'clock midnight on, these firefighters, these men and women of around the fire service responded. And to, you know, to say they stepped up is a major understatement. I mean, we monitored, and I monitored all the calls that night, right through, through that day. And it, it, there was a progression. It started out with trees on power lines, small fires on power lines and trees and that sort of thing. And then as the winds heightened up, the degree of calls increased. And when I mean degree, the rescue started. Calls for people trapped in their homes because a tree has fallen on it, or because the roof is blown off, or that their home was flooded. These men and women left their families, their homes, at the height of a storm to answer these calls, and they don't get paid one red cent to do it. Bear that in mind. when. You, when we talk about this storm. And they done that and are still doing that. Last night, last evening alone, we had four calls, trees on power lines. Well, that, that just didn't happen. That's, that's a result of what happened on this hurricane. So we made sure the departments were in the know on what was going on and uh, asked them, and, and most of them did comply with, they, they did make sure that both the EOC and transportation were aware of any, any major blockages or damages. On the 23rd, we also tried to get out, and I even on a, a couple of interviews, one with CBC, on the importance of generator safety. We, we knew this was going to be a factor when we were dealing with these types of winds. So we tried to get the message out the quickest way we can to the masses on the safety of generators, not only from a fire safety point of view, but also from a carbon monoxide point of view. And that, that did 
prevailed as the storm went on. So as I mentioned, when the storm had hit, uh, there were a number of blockages. Another item I do want to also make a note of as well, these fire departments responding to these calls opened the roads. A lot of them grabbed their chainsaws from home or off the apparatus to open these roads so that they were able to get to people. At the height of this storm, we had a major fire. We had the Stanhope Golf and Country Club. We had their clubhouse fire. The North Shore Fire Department had their members with chainsaws, local farmers with front end loaders to clear a path to get the apparatus down to that scene. And when they got there, they basically was like a castle with a moat because they couldn't get to it. There was four feet of water around that building. And if you had seen the look of defeat on the face of Jason Blackman, the North Shore Fire Chief, he says, we can't do anything about this. And unfortunately, they couldn't. I mean, they had fire apparatus going up fairways on the golf course, trying to find a way to get to it. So uh, as the storm progressed, there was a lot of these. We, our office went out to do damage assessments. Unfortunately, we got pulled away from that because of some fire investigation duties that were still ongoing. We had a number of smaller generator fires that we still had to follow up with. And this went on probably for the next couple of days on um, the 27th. And this is just a small snapshot of what our office done. I can give you the three page outline of what we did. Uh, but we started to prioritize with some of the uh, health care facilities that were still on generator power. We wanted to make sure things were safe there. Glad we did because we did find a few things that we had to get straightened out right away. And we did. And, and then it was to go on to, well, the schools were wanting to get open. So we wanted to make sure that the schools were safe. So my, my staff made sure we done 60 inspe fire inspections in all schools in PEI. And that went over into the weekend, into that Monday. Uh, we had a number of generator complaints that we had to follow up on, especially with uh, the major concern that we ran into there was uh, small generators being used in apartment buildings, on decks. Uh, <clears throat> we decided to go with the, uh, with the adage of doing door knocks and simply asking them to put them on the ground, make sure there was no back feeding, and if they were running cords to fridges, do it through a window. And for the most part, everybody complied with that. And there was probably in the area of 22 of them. And we still had in the area of 22 plus fire investigations that we had to conduct during the storm as well. So when you look at it, <clears throat> in total, there were 936 responses by fire services. 306 within the city of Charlottetown, 60 within the city of Summerside, and <clears throat> the rest of them being 574 within the rural areas. And that, was, that breakdown was pretty much everything under the gamut. As power did come on, we tried to get the, the word out on that. Uh, we were kind of half open because the time of day that the power went out, that people wouldn't have many stoves or anything like that on. Well, lo and behold, there was a few, uh, unfortunately. We did try to get that message out as best we can to the masses and the public to make sure that any appliances they had, they were shut off. We did run into a few of those, but not too many. Uh, but for the most part, um, like I said, it was our fire services. If there was ever a success story around this storm, it's them. And when you talk to them in your local areas, please pass along their thanks to them because like I said, these men and women left their homes, their families at the height of the storm to answer these calls and they're still answering them. Like even as of last night, they're still going to these calls. So that's pretty much my wrap up. Okay. And I think I just have one more slide, and it really is a quick one, just on recovery. Um, you know, as I said at the start of this, you know, we're just launching into our recovery, and so some of the work that we're doing is still working with the debris removal. Uh, we still have out-of-province um, resources coming from other jurisdictions to help with that debris removal, and parks and along with um, transportation. 
uh, down tree management is going to be a multi-year recovery plan. Um, I seen on CBC News just this morning them <coughs> referencing the softwood lumber industry may never recover. 50% of um, the softwood is down, um, at least not in our lifetimes. We won't see that. So it's going to be a long-term recovery, and I know Fire Marshal would speak to this as well, is um, we have risk now, an elevated risk of forest fire that we never had before to this level anyway. So now that's going to be multiple years. So that recovery is going to continue. Uh, provincial infrastructure will need to continue to need to be replaced, repaired, bridges, schools, all that type of thing. Um, so these are the kind of things that we kind of keep lens on. Um, for industry, for agriculture, like all those significant impacts. Our provincial disaster financial assistance for individuals, small business, and not-for-profits will be a year or two process. Um, usually the, the first year is the delivery of the program and file completion. The final year is really the, the administrative backside of it. But then municipalities in the province have up to five years to complete that program. Um, and then our after action, that continuous improvement um, will. So we take that after action and we wrap it all around the recovery work that we'll do and continue on. So there's lots of things happening. Uh, even yesterday, I seen the emergency forest Forestry Task Force announced to, to work on that downtree management. Uh, the climate change adaptation plan that was um, launched yesterday spoke to a lot of the things that we've recognized and noted as uh, highlights that need to, um, to be invested in um, <coughs> and looked at in a part of our recovery uh, to wrap around into our mitigation. So I think I am good there, unless there's, again, a question, or I can pass it off to okay, perfect. social dialogue. And I know it's it's tough. I know the committee probably has a lot of questions at this time. Is 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 are we are we okay to move on to the next part, or do, would you want to just do you want to ask questions right now? Okay, uh, that's okay. All right, perfect. So um, we'll do that. So we have uh, so far we have Sydney and Michelle on the list, and then Rob. Okay, Sydney. <coughs> thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you all for coming in today, um, and thank you for your your service. It's obviously been a, a certainly. A, Wild lead up and and uh, and uh, and since then, um, and, and Dave, thank you for your your passionate uh, uh, words uh, of our emergency services. It's much appreciated. Um, you had spoke about uh, the critical infrastructure, and, and kind of just if I can start there, and you know, it's uh, one of the you know one of the you talked about the, the the days without fuel. Maybe we can start there. And help us walk through uh, the tank farm, and spe specifically, you know, you've, you've heard the questions about backup generation for the, the tank farm. Um, you know, getting fuel here from off island, getting fuel out. What, you know, uh, uh, you know, can we can we regulate that? Can we force them to have backup power? Like, you know, give us the, you know, what was the prep? What do we do ahead of time, and then what have we learned since then, and what's going to change for, for the next time as far as making sure we have fuel available? Sure. So maybe I can go a little bit to my, the, I have a timeline kind of of conversations that we had, and actually um, the September 21st, so three days pre-event, uh, was one of the first conversations I had with Irving Oil. They came and reached out to me. Um, and kind of said, hey, we want to start uh, having conversations daily to figure out what this is going to look like. Uh, we, and Irving Oil is one of our partners on our uh, uh, operations center team as well. Um, but they want to have a kind of a closer uh, conversation because they knew that if there was going to be impacts, they wanted to be uh, kind of their feet first right into the EOC. Um, so we had those conversations in advance of, and I would say, multiple times through the day, not only with Irving Oil, but with all the suppliers. Um, so fuel being what it was for the first, um, really the first 36 hours while the tank farm was down. Um, as soon as it went down, we started talking with the Irving Oil and saying, uh, we want the generator here um, as quickly as possible, noting that the power didn't come back on, or sorry, um, high sided restrictions didn't um, get removed from the bridge until that evening. Um, so you know, there was nothing coming across the bridge that was high sided. Um, but they had already the plans to start um, moving the generator that they had at the Halifax uh, terminal. and. Um, getting it loaded uh, on a flatbed, that's how it was going to come over, and um, have it 
put power here. Uh, it was in transit. It was, I think, uh, two hours away when power came back on. Uh, but they kept on coming here just in the off chance that something uh, uh, went down. Uh, to your question about can we regulate it, um, I can't. That's not what's something I have authority to do. Uh, but I am, you know, whether it's an IRAC uh, regulatory piece, um, you know, there's not only the suppliers, there's the retailers as well. Um, so the retailers that had generator power could continue to deliver uh, or uh, sell fuel, uh, but only as long as they had the supply. Uh, and we spoke with every single one of those suppliers. We knew every single retailer that had a generator. Uh, and we reached out to every single one of them uh, a couple of times a day saying, what's your fuel supply? What do you need? Um, and if someone was running low or out, because that happened as well, we reached back to the suppliers and said, when is, when is the delivery coming? So every single morning for those first three or four days, I was getting delivery notifications of this is when the tanker is going to arrive at this particular retailer. Because um, then you also be aware that we then started uh, having to ask policing agencies to monitor that because um, there was the long lineups, access to get the tankers in, and all of the above. So there was a lot of conversations, a lot of conversations and discussions and requests, um, not only with Irving, but with all the, the suppliers. Um, one other supplier only has one tanker, de delivers every day. Um, we asked within the first couple of hours, we want a second tanker to expedite, to kind of keep that flow going. Um, and every single one of them complied and were almost, in some cases, 10 steps ahead of me. They were like, tankers are already, the second one's already en route, or we're already doing this. So, um, you know, their, their, uh, my impression from the work that we did with them was that they were very committed to make sure that fuel was always available where it was able to be distributed. Um, so c certainly from the Irving perspective and the tank farm, uh, you know, we've had many discussions over the past um, about the capacity here. Um, they did make sure that they installed a transfer sw switch several years ago, and that just enables them to plug into a generator really quickly without having all the uh, work on the electrician side. Um, but there's more to be done, without question. Um, we are dependent on the mainland for so much, and the bridge is our single source of you know, transport. So if this was in the middle of the winter, um, it could have been so much more worse. So we need to have the generator here. If I could state that with confidence, that's what I think we need. Um, how that happens, I don't have the authority to make that happen. Sydney? Thank you. Um, you know, the, the, you know the, the reaction was swift and all that kind of stuff too, but the conversation ahead of time about, about you know, we, you know, they obviously knew it was an issue. They had the transfer switch installed, that kind of thing. You know, was that conversation ever had that no, we need the generator here at all times ahead of time, especially you know, given you know past history? Like that was certainly conversations that I've had with with <coughs> Irving um, to say that that transfer switch is is good, but optimally we need to have a generator. Um, you know, they made they were a, a private corporation. They made a decision um, that I think they see now. Um, could have been different, um, but I think that's where we're trying to pivot. Is like moving forward. How do we do it? How do we prepare better for the next event? Um, so we actually had um, the minister and myself sat down with Irving. Um, I think it was. I've lost track of my days, but I want to say it was maybe a week and a half ago. Um, they came over and we had a conversation with them, and we made it very clear that our uh, desire is that the Irving Tank Farm here does have um, backup power committed there. Great. Sydney? Thank you, Chair. Um, and then as far as uh, stations are concerned, um, and you know, the fuel stations that had uh, backup power or generation service, and, and uh, can you walk me through how that's identified ahead of time? Because I've heard the terms about, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, the, the you know the emergency stations or you know they were designated as certain stations. Do we do we fund backup power to this? Are we just are we just as a province reliant on whoever happens to want to have backup generation? Um, obviously for this one we didn't have enough. Like you know we we've seen the lineups and and you've seen the problems that that creates for our, our you know our policing services and, and so, you know when they were already taxed doing other things they have to go and, and monitor the lineups that kind of thing. So walk me through how. Those stations are, you know, is it just random who had it, or do we offer any funding for backup, or 
and then what we're going to do going forward. So, um, so regulatory wise, it belongs with IRAC of what requirements um, gas stations would have. I, to my knowledge, um, there is no requirement for gas stations or suppliers or re retailers to have um, backup power. Um, but we proactively, several years ago, and I'm going to say in the 10 years ago, our office started reaching out to every single one of those <coughs> retailers. Uh, we got the, the listing from IRAC saying, where are the gas stations? Um, and we called every single one of them and said, do you have a generator? Uh, and we call and we refresh that on um, a yearly basis, um, more frequently if we hear of some changes. Um, and we ask them, do you deliver, you know, do you offer diesel and do you have generator power? Um, a lot for emergency response, like with those big vehicles need to get diesel fuel, so we want to know where the capacity. So we maintain that listing um, ourselves. Uh, so we knew what gas stations already had that capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you that the western end of the island um, has more capacity with more backup generator. And I think from previous events, uh, we've seen that there's usually the west end of the island got hit the worst in a lot of winter events. So they did their own proactive preparedness and many of the, the gas stations in the western uh, province, part of the province, has generator less down east, um, not that much in central where the majority of the population is. Um, so th there is no provincial that I'm aware of um, generator support, financial support. Um, so it's individual preparedness. And um, I think we actually did um, make contact to all the ones that didn't have a generator uh, after the event and asked the questions, are you guys considering having generators? And surprisingly, only a few have said, yes, we are considering it. A lot of them says, no, we're good. So um, that's, but that's a, a decision that either Iraq or the province needs to choose to do. Um, my, I would consider them a critical infrastructure folks and they should have backup power. Because without, pa without fuel, we don't have power. Like that's the critical function right there. It's the single point of failure when we don't have fuel. Sydney, last one, then we'll move to Michelle. Uh, thank you. Um, the you know, Maritime Electric had a lot of questions around the critical infrastructure and, and their decision to you know where to go first, and, and obviously, you know, there's it's probably very specific in the immediate aftermath, and then it splinters, I'd say, very heavily as time goes on, and, and they get to more spots. Um, you know, as far as where to focus on power first. How involved was EMO in that hierarchy of where we need to get power back first? And, sure. and do you feel you, you had enough over the past couple of years to prepare it and say it, uh, you know, where it, that needs to go? Yeah, so the, the listing that we started with, and I can say we started with, um, back in January actually, we started meeting with Maritime Electric and saying, what are the, what are the key sites that you see? And we, we focused on key ones because every day, can change, the time of year can change our listing. For example, um, schools could be a, a list considered a critical infrastructure site, but if the storm happens in the summer, it's not that important to us. Um, it's not on the top of our priority. Uh, again, the first ones that always sit there are the life safety ones. So any of the health facilities are on that list. All the hospitals, all the long-term care, community care facilities are on that list. Policing agencies, fire departments, emergency manage, or, or EMS sites, um, they're all there. Gas stations are all on that list. So we provided a list of about it was a little over 200 and saying these are our our top ones. Tank farm, I think, is the one that must come on, must be at the very top. All the other ones are just lists. It's not prioritized in any place because depending on where the power outage, you know who, you know who would have thought that we would have had an event that 100% of the island was in the dark. Um, we, just, we just never thought that that would be probable, but it was, it happened, like anything else, is that we try to prepare for the worst, but we, we kind of thought that, you know, Dorian, we have pockets that have power, so um, we thought that we'd be able to say, well, in this area, what do you need up first? Um, but for, for Fiona, it was, it's all out, which one do you want first? And we picked Tank Farm. Um, and we knew that a lot of our um, um, health facilities, or all of our health facilities, they're regulated and they're mandated to have backup power, public and private. Um, so that gave them some capacity, 
but we had to make sure that we had fuel delivery to them as well. Um, so every day, um, all of those people around that provincial operations center, they brought forward their respective priorities for restoration. Um, that list was given and, um, and, and kind of rated through that life safety piece and handed to Maritime Electric and saying, here's our list. Um, and then they had to navigate how they were going to try and meet that list based on the damage and the repairs that we needed to take. Great. Thank you. Um, we'll just, we'll go to Michelle. Thanks, Thanks. for those answers. Great. Thank you very Thanks. much. And I'm just going to make one quick statement first. Sure. Because there was just, so, just something there that you said that um, I'm not so sure I agree with when you said what, I think you said was it foreseeable that everybody would lose power in this storm. I do think that was foreseeable because if we look at other jurisdictions that have had massive hurricanes, that was actually what happened with them. And when you look at the track of this hurricane, it never changed, right? Like, yeah. so I have to actually disagree with you in that statement because as a disaster recovery agency that's looking after the province, power outage straight across this province must have been, had to have been, one of your scenarios that you were readying yourself for. And if I could just offer a clarifying statement, when, um, that when the, the, the statement of when we were talking with Maritime Electric in January, like when we were just talking generically about, um, you know, here's the listing, um, this would be, you know, let's plan for pockets. Um, you know, certainly if you heard the press conferences and the days in, in mm -hmm. advance, is we were saying, expect power to be out. It's going to be widespread. It's mm -hmm. going to be absolutely um, for up to two weeks. That, and so we knew that. Um, so yeah, so maybe my, my words weren't accurate. Um, I know that we do talk about, we've done exercises, uh, and we call them our blackout uh, exercises mm -hmm. about what happens with power. We did one a few years ago, and Tank Farm was was noted as without fuel, we, you know, we're, okay. we're done. So we've done that, but I guess maybe it's just wishful thinking on my part that I, for this storm, we just hoped that, um, you know, that we wouldn't be completely black for certainly the period of time that we did. Michelle? So now I'm going to start with my questions here. <laughs> um, I want to talk about uh, critical infrastructure from a telecommunications perspective, because mm -hmm. yeah. for the first couple of days there was issues, major issues, with um, ways for people to communicate, and 911 did not work for uh, for periods throughout the day. Can you tell me what happened to the 911 system? Sure. So I'll just make some notes. So. Um, I'll state first is, um, if I have my, the, our gentleman, our 911 coordinator here, he could probably speak more eloquently to it, but the 911 system never went down. Um, However, um, on, I, I have some notes here, so, because I asked for this, so the system was impacted. Uh, EMS, or sorry, uh, 911 system, um, the, the main site and the public safety answering point, um, the phone lines were impacted, but they have a backup site that they had actually proactively staffed and were sitting there and were able to transition calls to there. So even though the lines were impacted, uh, the system was still working. What was the challenge was individuals' ability to make a phone call on a cell phone or on a landline. So our system in the background was still working, it's the accessibility to the system. So if you were a bell or the towers were impacted or your phone wasn't working, you couldn't call. Um, but if, if you could call, and I, I know it's, it's splitting hairs, um, the system was there. The, the calls were being uh, answered and able to be answered. Um, again, at one point, and I have the, the, the notes here and the timelines, um, there's 10 phone lines in, uh, in both sites at one point. Uh, four of them were impacted, but the backup site was working in, at the same time. So that's what I know from the technical piece, um, which doesn't answer the question of, well, what about those individuals that couldn't make the phone call? Um, so that was, that again goes back to the telecommunication companies. Um, a lot of the, what they reported into us was, again, power outage. They didn't always have, um, they may have had batteries or generator, um, so they didn't have power as well. So that was the cause of the, those sites going down was because of lack of power. So back to the gas station, 
it also should be, those sites should also have backup power as well, without question. Michelle? Um, and so, I know another thing that you had said there, Tanya, was that it kind of goes back to the telecommunications. But I'm going to quote something out of the Dorian report. Sure. Okay, on page 33 of the Dorian report, it's Dorian report. It stated, moving forward, EMO will invite other te telecommunication providers to virtually participate in PEOC briefings it, to ensure full understanding of status and restoration of, ins of essential services. But I have no memory of t telecommunications companies ever participating in public briefings to answer to the challenges that people had with communications throughout the storm. Maritime Electric was there pretty much every day. Were they not invited or were they invited and they declined to join? So I, I didn't do up the invitation list for the press briefings, but I can tell you that uh, for Dorian, Bell Alliant was our only telecommunication provider that was a member of a provincial operations center. So the Dorian after action post that, we now have um, Bell, Rogers, TELUS, and Eastlink that are all members of our EOC team, and they were a part of those information sharing sessions every single day. They do that virtually, um, and that's one of the other things that we improved was that capabilities to bring them in virtually because they would be reporting possibly from Nova Scotia or New Brunswick, but participated on those calls every single day. Um, so they were reporting into the EOC, um, but if they were not at present at the press conference, that wasn't for me to decide who needed to be there. Michelle? Sure. So th that's concerning because I also heard during some of those press conferences where people had asked telecommunication uh, questions and you had said that you can't speak for them, but yet in um, subsequent press briefings, they weren't there to actually speak to it, which obviously the public wanted to know what happened, what was going on. because. That's, for me, communications was like, even when you speak to fire people in the fire services, people for, for all the first responders, their pick radios didn't work. Their cell phones didn't work. They went back to like old school style of trying to um, capture those emergency calls because they were dark. And so how are we going to move forward to ensure that people that need to be at that table to answer questions are actually going to be accountable because like I still have to ask why you had Maritime Electric there but you didn't invite nobody seemed to think that having telecommunications at the table mm -hmm. when communications was a complete failure as well in those early days of the storm why did nobody think that you should have had them at the forefront so their questions could be asked so you make an absolute excellent point. So I will certainly take that back. But uh, again, it wasn't for me to to make up the list of who was presenting at thing. But it will be sub absolutely something that we should be uh, tasking to our telecommunications with expectations. Um, I think um, from an EMO perspective, those will be the conversations we need to have with our telecommunications of what our expectations are moving forward. Um, you know, from Dorian, we got them at the table. Um, you know, they're reporting into us, um, but they need to be able to be present, to be able to speak, because I can't speak for them. Like, I can't speak for any of the other agencies. Um, I don't know their operations enough. So, you know, whether or not, I know Nova Scotia passed legis or are working on passing legislation requiring telecommunications mm -hmm. to do work. Yeah. Um, so that's something that we are actually watching really closely to see how that pans out. Uh, and we'll be talking with our partners as well in the other provinces to see um, how, how do we do that better, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to go back to the Dorian report again. So EMO, EMO uses Sentinel for emergency as your emergency management tool, but in the Dorian report it was identified that it was inadequate. Are you still using the same program? We still have the same program, but um, I'll tell you it's, it's heavy to use. It requires a couple of staff dedicated only to that system. Um, and honestly, for for this event, I don't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't have made um, much in that whole scheme of things different. It does a couple of things for us that we like to have at the ready. Uh, one of which is our ability to reach out to our provincial operations center uh, team uh, with a quick notification if uh, if all our systems were down and we couldn't reach. We have a bit of uh, some redundancy there. Um, 
all our contact lists are saved uh, on this system, which is in the cloud, so we have access to it. So it's a good redundancy, but from a, a logs and tracking, we have a couple of other processes that we were using. Um, the, the most effective way to have Sentinel in our space would be that every single person that would be in that space also uses it. Um, and that is a huge um, learning curve for a lot of the people to try and learn this new system. Uh, so we kind of keep it in the background. We use it as a, kind of a storage tool repository for our documents, um, some of our redundancies so that we have access to it if something goes down. But we don't use probably the full feature of what could be used. Thanks, Michelle. We'll come, uh, Rob? Yeah, thanks a lot for your presentation. Always interesting. I just say I had a lot of notes here to just on some comments that have been made so far. And I guess the, the, the first one that kind of comes to mind, you'd mentioned that the Queen's funeral caused a delay. What why, what would that have to do with the delay? Um, I mean, I, you're it, assuming it was, the holidays, the no, storm's coming the holidays. Yeah, sorry, um, to clarify. Um, it wasn't that it caused a delay because it was a, a provincial holiday. Um, some of the, our federal partners, so our Canadian Hurricane Center, um, they weren't uh, probably at the same stance. We were watching Fiona as it developed all the way down and how it uh, snaked all the way up to the. So we were watching it, absolutely. Um, but I think, again, people getting back to the offices um, and asking. Um, and being able to communicate with all of our partners, probably in Folsom. Um, we were doing things on, on Tuesday, but we didn't officially activate it until Wednesday. Rob? You, you, well, anyway, I guess I'm, I just wonder why that would even have any impact on anything, regardless of Hurricane yeah. Center or here. I mean, you'd have to assume that uh, that uh, that just wouldn't even be a factor. But, but anyway, I, I, but I want to get back a little more to the gas and diesel distribution. You said that some gas stations were without gas. Well, in my district, they were all without gas. It wasn't that they didn't have generators. There was one of the three stations in my district had uh, had a generator, but they didn't have gas. Right. They didn't know what, nothing to pump it. And there wasn't enough capacity, so whenever they did get operational, everybody went to that one, mm. drained it out very quickly. Um, so I'm really wondering about your authority as the EMO. Um, why don't you have the authority to indicate to, say, Irving's, if that's the indication that you have to have a generator there? Um, or who, who do you ref, refer that information to? Do, I mean, do you just make the recommendation to somebody and somebody doesn't do anything with it? Or do you rec recommend that to who? <laughs> um, and I think we've, we've probably wobbled on that a little bit to kind of uh, understand who has authority. I don't have authority. If, uh, if our Emergency Measures Act uh, needs to be updated to make that, um, that's a solid recommendation that I would uh, endorse 100%. Uh, IRAC has the capability, um, I believe, because they're the regulatory uh, arm over retailers, and, and I pres don't know if they're over suppliers. I'm maybe assuming that. Um, so I think there's, there's an opportunity. We've always had good faith within uh, the suppliers. And again, speaking to any of the suppliers, um, when we said we want fuel delivered here, we're on their way. Like they, they physically couldn't keep up because the tank farm was down uh, and because of the enormous amount of uh, demand for fuel. Um, you, I know that one retailer spoke about selling like five or six times volume in one day in comparison to like the day before the storm. So again, demand was so significant, those suppliers, those tankers just couldn't make up that physical demand. Um, so that had a huge impact on those suppliers keeping and maintaining fuel load. Rob? So, so you're blaming Iraq, that Iraq is not the one, they're the ones that should have been able to have seen this coming and should have uh, yeah, made that recommendation? Or is that a, a Department of Public Safety should have recommended that to Irving? Or uh, I'm just still a little Yeah, I'm not in. blaming anyone. I think that within Iraq, they have authority to make the regulations for retailers. I don't currently have that authority, so if we want to change um, that, um, and that, that's one of the after action items that we've, I've made note of, is to review legislation, not only Emergency Ma uh, Measures Act, but other authorities as it relates to storm response and recovery. Like, do we have the right legislation in place to affect the response that we really feel that we need to have. Um, there is lots of gaps in it, and I will say that comfortably here, that needs to be addressed. 
Right. So how, why hasn't that been addressed? And when we had Dorian, and now this one, and you're identifying gaps, and nothing's happened. And we've had debates here in this legislature about, you know, granting more authority to uh, certain acts that were under emergency situations. We debated it pretty heavy in the pandemic, but yet nothing happened. Is that and, what you're saying? Yeah, I can certainly only speak to the work that our department, like I know, I know our Emergency Measures Act, is has been on the agenda before for updates. Um, I can't tell you when, um, but you know, if I could push it up and push it up a little bit, I would be very happy to see that. Um, but that is a process that I don't have influence to. Um, but if I can say it here, it's it's certainly absolutely something that needs to be moved to the top. Yeah, it'll be on the list for more later. Sure. Uh, Carla? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm still kind of stuck on something, the discrepancy of, of something that you said, and I know that you explained it, but it just kind of as a little tiny preamble to the question when you said um, who could have anticipated the power outages that we had. And then, and then, as you explained, the answer said that you were preparing for two weeks of power outages, yet it was communicated to Islanders to prepare for three to five days. Where's, wh why the discrepancy? Sure, so I know in, in emergency management, we use that 72 hour preparedness kind of more generically. Um, it's something that we say, you know, we encourage every individual to be prepared for a minimum 72 hours, but we also say we're capable, we're able to, but also it's to ensure that uh, emergency services can direct um, their resources to the most urgent care. So that it's it's a guideline. We're not saying that we're not going to respond to people until three days is uh, is up. It's it's just it, it's really helpful to um, to support emergency management, emergency services if people have some level of preparedness at home. So that's the three days. And I think even during um, uh, COVID times. You know, there's been discussions that, you know, is three days really sufficient to even encourage people uh, to do? It should be noted that being having a 72-hour preparedness kit also comes with cost. Uh, individuals uh, struggle to do that. So that's something that, um, you know, giving us three days, giving municipalities, the province, whatever agencies to be able to ramp up, um, that gives them some better capability to do that in that three-day window if they have the ability to do that. So I, I think we need to expand, without question. Yeah. I think we need to expand a three-day preparedness to a week at a minimum. Carla? Thank you, Chair. And I agree, you know, and on two, two sides of this, people can't afford to prepare for three, mm -hmm. to five, three to five days. Yet we knew it would be two weeks. So we, I think we set Islanders up because people were upset. You know, they didn't have the food, um, which leads me into... Um, the food and, and communications and all of the other things. You said that we work, we all work together for preparedness. And I'm really wondering what it looked like this time. I'm wondering how, how did that unfold? What community stakeholders were involved? What sorts of things were said and um, about the design of a disaster support program? Um, and when you say disaster support program, well, uh, what, I guess for the emergency preparedness in general. Sorry, how? What did that look like? Who was at the table? And and what were some of the discussions in like a Coles Notes version? <laughs> um, that's what I do every day for 365 days a year. It's hard to do with Coles Notes, um, but. Um, uh, um, in advance of, just in advance of Fiona, or are we talking like in years of preparedness? Well, what I'm wondering is, and I guess we, that might be too much detail to get into mm. right now, but what I'm wondering is, is what were the discussions of how things were prioritized? Um, so let me, I'll get a bit more specific. Mm. I'm wondering in particular about the preparations that went in for more vulnerable citizens, so our unhoused citizens and our seniors. Um, so what did those specific plans look like, and did that, did those plans account for power being out for up to two weeks, like because your office knew that that was one of the scenarios? Sure. So maybe um, I hate deferring questions, but I, I think that it might be more helpful to, because that is really an area that social development housing, who would be at our table, um, would take on that responsibility, remembering that EMO, we're, we're just coordinating all the departments and agencies, so we're just making sure that they're kind of on task and reporting into us, but I think social development probably may speak to that in the presentation that they have, yeah, and that might be more yeah. appropriate. Yeah. Carla? Okay. Can I have two, like one one question, then one really quick one? Yeah, okay. and just, just so you know, 
Okay. My plan's gone out the window. <laughs> it's okay. So in the context of the Fiona response, could you provide examples of decisions that are made by EMO, um, within EMO, and then which of those decisions would require escalation to Cabinet for approval? Um, I think there's, um, again, as, as things come into EMO, what we do, whether or not it's a department reporting into us or a municipality reporting into us or an, an agency, we take that and we task it to another department. If you look at our provincial all hazards plan, it outlines all the government departments and what their specific responsibilities are. So, you know, our task is to send it off to social development housing or to fire marshal or Department of Transportation and their job is to action it and then report back to us so that we kind of keep again that provincial picture. Um, so that's kind of how we're pushing and pulling information um, as it relates to for this particular one uh, would be um, day one on the Saturday, we were um, making the request for provincial disaster financial assistance. We made the formal request to federal government on that morning. We had the letters drafted uh, in advance of Fiona, knowing that we were going to probably, or uh, I'm 100% one, confident, no, but 99% confident that we were going to be making a request based on the way the track, but the way everything was looking, we'd probably make a request to federal government. So we had those pre-drafted, but we would have to get uh, cabinet approval to launch the provincial disaster financial assistance. So we uh, we did all those kind of documents. That would have been one specific one that we needed cabinet approval on. Uh, last thing. Well, you... if you if you put me back on the list, I'll wait till after. Okay. Thank perfect. You. So we'll just we'll wait on that. Uh, Zach. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you all for coming in today, too. Um, my question is kind of along the lines of what Michelle had said. You know, um, communication, I think, is probably one of the most important things. I, I agree as well with the tank firm. Um, you know, working in the fuel industry, a lot of people would phone me and say, I that those that could get through and you know say why is there no fuel etc and I try to explain that to them from just from my previous knowledge but um, you had mentioned that you had a meeting with the with Irving um, immediately following or a week and a half ago or whatever the time frame was have you had that meeting with the telecommunications companies or are you planning that uh, meeting um, I haven't had an uh, in-person meeting just happened to be Irving folks were coming over to the province to uh, to meet with some other stakeholders, so they asked, um, and we asked, if you're coming over, can we can we sit down with you? Uh, I've had uh, email with all of the the telecommunication companies, and we asked some some quick uh, kind of understanding what the issues were, because um, you know were the issues because they had uh, no generator, or did they have fuel issues? Like what were the the things that were pointing out for them uh, as their needs. And, you know, I had questions whether or not on those first few days was there capacity issues? Um, you know, did the systems, were they able to manage all the network activity? Because people were at home trying to, you know, live stream or mm -hmm. send whatever. So I was curious if there was any um, information on that. Um, what I, all four of them have responded uh, with. Um, their systems, how they uh, seen it was mostly from a, a power outage. Their, their towers sustained very little damage from wind, um, but they were impacted because of loss of power. Um, that is all being funneled right now underneath uh, a working group under CRTC, who is the regulatory uh, agencies for all the telecommunication partners. Um, but it's certainly something that uh, we, t we talked about just actually yesterday of, um, you know, we need to get all these telecommunications folks in a room. Um, there's always that, um, that uncomfortable conversation of, we need the information, and they're like, well, we don't want to give it to you, but we have to find a way to get that information. Um, so they're not mandated to do that. So whether or not it's going to come at a federal level or at a provincial level, but that will be something that we want to change moving forward. Zach? Thank you, Chair, and thank you. Yeah, I do think that is critical, um, you know, because I can only speak from a personal point of view when constituents would reach out and, you know, some of them didn't get through. You get the message maybe even a day later or something like that. And again, touching on what Michelle had mentioned with Dave, Dave, you spoke with such passion 
maybe can you tell us about the frustrations because you know constituents are reaching out to me for you know things that they find very important but you know no constituents are reaching out to me because you know their business is on fire or you know their fear of a generator of carbon monoxide maybe can you talk about the frustrations that you had with having no uh, essentially little to no communication um, through cell phones or through calls etc well, and, and we done check-ins throughout the storm, not only beforehand, but uh, actually the day after and into the second week with all the chiefs, basically asking, you know, what are your major issues that are at play? And yes, the communications thing came up, but there are some certain redundancies in there uh, with respect to there's the cell phones. It wasn't just a blanket of them that went down. There were some of them that went down, whether it would be Bell or tell us or whatnot, and they were in pockets. And <clears throat> we, they still, departments still have their regular paging systems, and they still have the PIX2 radios. And I know, Michelle, you had mentioned that they went down. There were a couple of small blips, but overall, the PIX2 system stayed up. And I mean, I know that firsthand because I had a radio on my hip literally for three weeks, uh, and we were able to communicate, I know, with fire dispatch vast majority of the time. There was some instances, I know Charlottetown Police had some issues with their portables. Uh, that ended up getting straightened out, I think it was on day three or four. Uh, but as far as the fire departments go, like their communication part of it, there are a number of redundancies put into play and they, we didn't really hear that from the chiefs, from that aspect of it. Okay. Zach? Thank you, Chair. It's tough only having a couple of questions. Um, one more follow-up question for Dave, if that's possible. You know, um, when, when you talk about, you know, how big this storm was, and you, I think you really emphasize that, maybe in a comparative way, can you compare, you know, the, the size of this storm to maybe even a Dorian, which is somewhat... No. Familiar? There's no. no way. The 200-year-old trees came down everywhere, like not just in Charlottetown, but everywhere. And, I mean, I've been literally tip to tip in the three weeks after that storm it hit. Um, and I mean, if you were driving along Route 2 with Trans Canada, you didn't really see that. You get off on some of the side roads, and you see the shell of a burn on one side of the road and the roof on the other. And you see this as you continually go down the country road. Um, like the likes of the 48 road, there, there's a number of these side roads that this had happened. Um, you know, we, we had a uh, structure fire here two weeks ago, and my heart went out to them. Uh, they were potato farmers, and it was actually a house fire. Not related to the storm, but as I pull in the air, there's a roof off of one burn, and one burn is completely gone, and they're starting to reconstruct it. So <clears throat> the effects in the rural areas, and there were a lot of effects within the city as well. Like Charlottetown Fire, for an example, that morning of the storm, they had to periodically pull their crews off of the streets around 6 a.m. because they were literally dodging falling trees. And we're not talking small ones, we're talking huge ones. Uh, they were only off the road for maybe a half hour, 45 minutes. Uh, alarms were piling up and, and calls for service, so they got out there as quick as they can. And even some of the streets they could not get down because of the size of the trees that came down. I mean, I live in Greenwich. Um, across from me, I had a, a beautiful stand of spruce. I now have a water view. And I mean, this storm literally snapped trees in half. I have never seen that, and I never want to see that again. Uh, because when we were dealing with gusts of wind from 140 to 150 kilometers, yeah, it does some pretty uh, unique things. Mother Nature taught us who the boss was. Zach? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you again for speaking with such passion. Um, this is an easy probably question for me to ask, a tougher one maybe for you to answer, Tanya, but um, you had mentioned earlier in your presentation about, um, you know, you're in the recovery mode right now in the levels, I believe it was, level two, um, and you said, you know, after, I guess it was every day, you're, you know, you're asking or you continue to ask yourselves as a group, you know, what could we do better or what should we do better? You know, uh, are you, you know, is there anything that you can say that, oh my goodness, yes, we should have done better here, or yeah, you know, we're pretty happy with what we did here? Um, I, I have a list. Um, I'm making can the, the, the list grows every day. Um, I think uh, from a very EMO centric, but I can also speak for fire marshal as well, <coughs> is our staff capacity is certainly um, below what we need. Um, you know, easily, I think in our space, um, 
we recognized we had probably need another four or five staff um, in a permanent to to work on the, fo the those files like critical infrastructure, working with our telcos and our electrical companies. Uh, business continuity was a huge piece that a lot of people wouldn't have heard, um, but was working on the background of it. Uh, we got New Brunswick staff um, from New Brunswick EMO. We had them for them there for almost two weeks, um, and we needed them because we didn't have capacity because we were we were operational for 24 days. Um, some of those staff never had a day off in that 24 days, so you know that we need to have augmented. Same for fire marshals. You know they have a staff of four. They easily could double up if that you know if that's what the the mandate looks like. Um, our facility um, is. We always thought our facility was fantastic. It was uh, going to meet all the needs that we had, and within three days we had taken over uh, another floor of our space in our, in our building uh, because we were sitting on top of each other. We could not function. Um, so we had to take over, like basically double our space. Because if we double our staff or we have more staff because we're at capacity, um, space for effectiveness really needs to happen. Um, Picks two radios while the system worked well. Uh, we need more portable radios that we could have deployed to some of our partners around the table that if they're out in the roads uh, could be communicating back into us. Um, one of the other pieces that we developed kind of on the fly was a GIS uh, mapping and uh, what we call the common operating picture um, to basically take all the data that we were getting of where the roads were blocked and where the power was off and where our infrastructure sites were, all these pieces. We had all this, all this information, but we had no means to really look at it in one single view. Uh, so that was a huge piece for us that we um, we managed to get uh, kind of a crude rendition of it, but it needs to be a bit more permanency to it. Um, authority legislation, absolutely, is you know these are the high ones that we knew and know continually tend to be a challenge, uh, and backup power for um, any of those critical infrastructure. Um, even individuals, there's, we've got to find a way to build more resiliency. I think our level of resiliency that we thought within the island, we always say, oh, islanders are so resilient. Well, we have a new, new bar to reach now, I think, to be fair to say. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, you know, in advance of an event, often will say, oh, no, I'm good, I'm ready, I'm prepared, won't be that bad. Um, I think we just need to take a step back and say, you know, the forecast was bang on from what Environment Canada provided. And we just need to hear that and really listen to it uh, any time that there's a significant event. Because if it's not a hurricane, it's an ice storm. Uh, it's, it's something else or another hurricane that could be worse. So we really need to hear those and, um, and listen and respond to that. So those are our big kind of highlights that we feel that we need to, to at least start on. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle for two, Rob, uh, Carla, and then, then we'll move on. Perfect. Great, Over thanks. To the um, so I want to go back to the Dorian report, and there were several recommendations made in that. Um, can you tell me who is responsible to implement all of those recommendations? Like, you've described your role mm -hmm. as basically the project manager of EMO, yeah. right? Um, so based on that Dorian report, who was responsible to ensure that all of the recommendations were implemented and where are we with that implementation? Sure, and I wish I would have brought uh, a copy of my document with me, but I can speak to um, the implementation working group that was established um, post um, the Callion report. Um, and I'm going to go by memory. There was myself was on as that kind of project lead for that. Uh, we had representation from um, Public Service Commission, our ITSS uh, information uh, IT system, um, communications, and there was another one. And I feel badly that I miss who it was. Um, finance, maybe. Um, anyway, it was for kind of of the corporate uh, sections of the province. So we took on. Um, the tasks of reviewing those recommendations and, and working to implement them. And I can tell you that there was really only two that didn't have, uh, that weren't complete. Um, after a year, we spent the whole year and had met all those recommendations to, to some degree or another, um, but there was only two, and the two that were left off the, off the, the, the chart or the complete stage was augmenting PEI EMO staff and the other one was developing provincial policy for government departments around business continuity. 
So those were the two that just <coughs> never got traction. Um, mm -hmm. Again, Seems um, like there's more than that. Requests were made, so you know. But everything else, um, and I, we can provide you with a summary document of where those uh, recommendations. Because I do have that, because yeah. uh, we tracked it every single month, and we provided updates to our up through our department, uh, and can provide you with a list of what that was. Great, Michelle. Okay. Thanks, you. Thank you, Chair. And I, I think that that would be a valuable document for the committee to have. Um, there was one statement you had made, and that was life, life, life safety trumps everything. Um, and so I want to look at like the core infrastructure when it comes to transportation because I can look in my district, the in intersection right over the Hillsborough Bridge was out for, it didn't come back on until day six and that's an intersection like that connects pretty much all of Eastern PEI into the city. Right. Um, that one was out, the one around the, the gas station in my district was out. That was a nightmare to try to drive through that. If you want to talk about putting people's lives at risk. Mm -hmm. um, don't don't turn up those traffic lights. Like yeah. we literally had an off-duty police officer one day out there trying to direct traffic because it was so dangerous. So why were the core in like infrastructure when it comes to like traffic lights to um, manage, you know, how you're going to get through those intersections? I know the one with the deferred right-hand turn. That one had a generator. <laughs> Was that not something that came like out of Dorian? Because I'm shocked that that took. I had to reach out to the minister to say, why don't why do we not have that intersection at the bridge turned up yet? Because I couldn't drive through that intersection without horns honking and mm -hmm. near collisions. And so, why were those that core? Why was that core infrastructure not prioritized? And it, when I say we, when we say life safety, it doesn't mean just humans of. Um, of a facility, like a health facility. So, you know, if if um, if that site was sent in and then identified as a priority, then absolutely it would have landed there because of kind of that note to public safety. I should also say is that those priorities and those sites and those locations where issues were happening, um, we were prioritizing as they were being identified to us. So, again, I don't like to defer, but that's a, really a transportation uh, request and uh, information to them. I do know that they do have the generator at the deferred uh, East mm -hmm. Royalty one, and that was because of the complexity of the site. I do know we had a power outage, I'm going to say, a year or so ago, um, and that was one of the comments that transportation shared with me, is that they do that um, because of the complexity of that one. Um, and maybe that's again a recommendation that should be included for any type of you know significant in, um, intersections um, that they have backup power. Um, yeah, that's the best I can offer on that one. Rob, yeah, uh, just to get a little more of a sense of you, you did mention the minister met with uh, Irvings and the tank farm about a month later. Uh, from the event, but do you report to the Minister of Public Safety or to the Premier, or what, what's the organizational chart here that sort of we have to follow uh, and that goes down below you to, to get, and, and how experienced is everybody in these roles and these positions? Can you, Do you have that, or is there something you can yeah, provide? Yeah, I have that? My, my visual org chart. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, so as the Director of Public Safety, so our actually our division, which includes EMO, Fire Marshal, but it also includes 911, uh, civic addressing, uh, I'm going to forget one of them, but there's 10, uh, the firearms office, conservation and enforcement, uh, provincial policing, coroner's office, um, and I'm, I'm missing one, I think, uh, or two. Um, so that is the Division of Public Safety, of which is in the Department of Justice and Public Safety. Uh, so we do, I report to the Deputy Minister directly, and then the Minister of Public Safety, Justice and Public Safety. Uh, so yeah, I don't report to uh, to the Premier directly, it's through that To so the Minister of Public Safety reports Correct. the Premier. Yeah. Okay. Rob? Uh, yeah, so, uh, do you have, the, can you provide that to our committee, so, some sort of an organization? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, I want to say I, we have several, um, um, not only departmentally, I think that was, we often do them up for our budget books, I believe, um, so we should have it there, um, but I can, I can make one pretty quickly okay. as well. I, I, I have a question for Dave now. Uh, just regarding, uh, the, you, we talked a lot about fire risk, forest fire risk, and obviously we had a committee in here uh, that we talked about uh, the, the uh, private landowners uh, situation, but uh, do, what, do you have specific recommendations to either government or landowners on what they're supposed to do to hopefully mitigate these forest fire risks? Uh, I, I know I, I've got quite a bit of a mess in my own woodlot, yeah. and, and I'm not and, saying and, government and, should be responsible, but I, I need to either yeah. figure this out. And, and unfortunately, 
That does fall under the Fire Prevention Act, but the current act is split under two ministers, and that forestry section is, falls under environment because there is a forestry section within the Department of Environment. It falls under uh, land and wildlife or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we are in talks with them right now. We have another meeting with them next week with the forestry section just to plot a plan on how we're going to address this for the next spring. Uh, like, I mean, they're going to be into the guts of it as far as the public and private uh, woodlot owners. But, I mean, it's going to be our fire service that's going to be responding the first ones to any incident like that. So, I mean, there's going to have to be a huge public education tool put into play. There's going to have to be some backed up redundancies in the event of things get out of hand, whether they're out of province assets or something like that. But that, again, is going to be the lead from uh, the Forestry Division with under the Department of Environment. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Carla, and then after Carla, we'll, we'll, we'll do two questions each. Then we're going to take a four or five minute break uh, for everybody, and then and then we'll come back, and then we'll we'll have both groups here until twelve, maybe five after twelve. So, great, Carla. Thank you, Chair. One of the my two remaining questions were around um, kind of digging in a bit more into the the decisions that you require cabinet to make. I'm kind of hoping that with the, the flow chart that you provide us, that may provide a bit more clarity, but if I have more questions around that, can I can I reach out to you Absolutely. another time? Absolutely, well, I don't know what the appropriate process through is, but I should note that, um, you know, there's the, there's the day-to-day -day operations of our reporting and then how we do things operationally when we activate. Uh, sometimes is a little bit uh, different. Um, for example, communications. Communications on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis is uh, managed underneath the communications department, CAPE. Um, but operationally, when we activate, uh, we kind of take over communications. Um, you know, there's just, we just operate a little bit, because it's an emergency. We want to make sure urgent messages are getting out uh, in the most efficient uh, timeline. So um, I don't think it would see any difference from what, um, what was asked in regards to our org chart, but um, just I just use that as a caveat that you know when we go operationally, we kind of everybody's in the room, our minister is there, and you know we're kind of talking all collectively. I just spoke to the clerk too. She's going to reach out and uh, get the necessary documents and information. Okay. Uh, hopefully, it will. Okay. Thanks, I Carol. appreciate that because I get there would be a bit of confusion for me if, if the ministers are sitting at the table like what that looks like do they still have to go back to cabinet and when things are heightened do they have different um, decision-making authority but I don't want to waste my last question yeah, no, not waste, I, would, <laughs> I would say is they're not physically at the table with us they're not at our table um, if that makes any sense um, yeah, they're not at our table. Like, it's departmental representatives that are what we call DSOs, Departmental Emergency Services Officers, that represent the government departments at in, uh, our operations center. Okay. Well, Thank you, quick. Chair. I will. <laughs> I would, I'd like to talk about the um, line that I knew nothing about until um, a friend of mine reached out to me after seeing a social media post I'd made about an emergency number, provincial number that you can call where PEI Ground Search and Rescue will go out and do wellness checks for people. And um, from two experiences that I've heard from people who have called the line were that there, it was gatekeeping, that they were being told that things were fine in certain locations when they indeed weren't. And so had to throw around my name um, to say, I'm actually calling on behalf of Carla Bernard. Um, and then it was activated, which I don't, I think is, wrong on every level it shouldn't you shouldn't require an MLA to get wellness check on a senior who's been without power for two weeks with no phone no way to communicate fallen on the floor blood all over their faces we should not need an MLA to escalate that so that um, so it's you've said life safety is number one right and I, and I know there's some context in there if you're speaking specifically about kind of the, the health um, services and all of that stuff but I dare say in a provincially owned building when we've got a group of seniors like that, that that would be a, a priority. So I'm wondering, in my mind, if someone calls that line for wellness check, that should almost be treated like um, a cry for help in a, in a potential suicide attempt. And so I'm wondering, like, how do we, so I know that PA Ground Search and Rescue were deployed, they went, 
Um, and from my understanding, they will write a report and, re and put that into your office. Will that report or any report coming from PA Ground Search and Rescue from those wellness checks, will they be made public? Um, I can't see why not um, without uh, disclosing personal information, of obviously, course. but I think a summary report would be something actually that we'd be looking for. I should use the caveat as well that uh, GSAR were doing the wellness checks, but they weren't the only agency doing wellness checks as well. And that phone number that we established was really um, in the moment, like we did at the day of, and say, let's assign this, uh, let's get that 1-800 uh, number um, established and set up to do wellness checks. Um, and really there were door knocks, you know, ideally what we wanted to do is try to find a way to reach and connect with individuals that may not have been able to reach out. Uh, so, you know, in our first thoughts were, you know, if someone knew of a family member that maybe they were from out of province and they said, hey, can you go knock on her door and make sure she's okay? Um, I haven't heard from, from her a couple days. That's kind of where we were starting with. Um, and I think as the days progressed, uh, kind of the significance uh, in some of those events were not quite what we had um, had anticipated. There was more than just door knocks and door checks. There were, again, those individuals that were that had needs. So then we had to expand that and engage other partners to do those activities, um, referring some of the stuff to health because they were health related. And that's not what the ground search and rescue folks, and that's what the intent of our program originally was, was just to make sure and, and that door knock would then initiate um, a referral to another agency that could respond to them. Thank I you. think that's a takeaway, again, if I sure. could say, as a real thing that needs to be more uh, developed and easy to f turn the switch on, like day one versus day whatever. Thanks. Uh, uh, Peter, two. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, I'm going to focus on infrastructure that was deemed to be critical. And you mentioned earlier, Tanya, that there's a list of 200 or so yeah. pieces of provincial infrastructure that, that are deemed as critical. And I think you said, and, and I, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is no priority amongst those critical, that list of critical infrastructure. We saw, of course, um, shortly after Fiona arrived that that critical infrastructure, wh whatever the list is, and you, you talked about a few of them, health centres, nursing homes, etc., um, that it was going to take some time before power was going to be restored to some of those critical pieces of infrastructure. And my question is, who determines what order <coughs> power is restored? Is that something that government through EMO mandates to Maritime Electric, or does Maritime Electric get to choose which bits of that critical infrastructure will be restored and in which order? Um, so I'll start with that list of 200. I think the, only, the, the one thing that we did label as number one was Riverside Drive Tank Farm um, and QEH, So because it's all on the same line, um, of which is also the Riverside Drive uh, inter uh, that intersection, sorry, um, up by East Royalty, yeah, sorry. Um, so that's all in the same line. So that we always said, you know, at a minimum, if that's down, we need to have that up. So that was the num one of the number ones, one of the number ones. All the other ones were just uh, categorized, as I, um, you remember the slide, I had the 10 different uh, sectors. So we listed uh, all what we felt were the, the primary um, CI sites under each sector. So, you know, energy, for example, we listed uh, all the suppliers and retailers underneath that section. Uh, safety listed all fire stations. So we, d we didn't have them um, prioritized on that list. We had them bundled. Um, and then we gave those to Maritime Electric. They plotted them on their map uh, so that they knew where they were. So we could say, um, they could come back to us and said, this area is where we're working on today because that's, that's where the work is. Um, what do you need up? And we would say, here are the sites that we need up. So they would put their focus and attention on that particular area. Um, and you know, it might be better to ask them how they do that. Uh, we didn't tell them, get that site on. Um, I guess we did. We would say, here are the sites that we need on, but we didn't tell them how to do it and in what order. Because they have to do that. They have to figure out, uh, how do we get there? Uh, the trees or the lines that need to be um, 
repaired to get to that site. So you know how they restore the power, we don't tell them how to restore power. We tell them the sites that we want as a priority, and they work their um, their primary goal is to get there. But you know the, the process to get there, I can't speak to. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, we don't mandate them. We provide them the list. They work really hard to to make that and get that on today or as soon as possible. But it's it's the work to get there that they have to direct and, and figure out how to do. Peter, thanks. I realize I only have two questions through the chair, so I have lots of follow-ups. I would love to ask on your answer there, but they will wait for another yeah. day. Um, I'd like to now move to the very opening statement that you made, actually, Tanya, which was that you're here in front of committee this morning, but in a very different way from following Dorian, because that was a year mm -hmm. after the event. You had time to absorb the lessons to be learned, and I think you, you said at the moment we don't know exactly what the lessons to be learned are. We're aware of where the problems are. We're trying hard as a standing committee here this morning in a very limited time, um, and clearly with a very limited number of questions, to dig down into where the real questions need to be asked and, where, um, and, and the, all of the information that we need to know. We're not going to be able to do that this morning. I would suggest that we need to have further investigation in order that Islanders can get all of the information they require through whatever mechanism that is. Do you have any thoughts on whether, uh, firstly, would you agree with me that we need further investigation beyond the great work that the standing committees have done this week, and this is, what, fifth meeting or so? Uh, and if so, what, what would you like to see in order to get the best information, the most information that Islanders deserve to have? So absolutely, uh, more investigation without question. Um, and again, if you recall my statement earlier, is that continuous improvement is uh, is embedded into emergency management. We're literally, I I go back to my years as a firefighter as well. The minute you come back into the hall and you've come back, we say, what do we do well, and how do we do it better next time? So that is always there. I appreciate three hours will. Uh, just isn't enough time, and I know I've consumed a lot of today's meeting. Um, but absolutely, what's the process to do that? Um, you know, in the broad term of an after action, um, a review program, absolutely. I think we should expand what we did in uh, Dorian. We need to have more um, consultation with public, uh, more more engagement. We did a survey online, but it, I don't know if it was really it would not meet kind of what we want to do for this one. Um, and again, Dorian's was very focused on EMO. Um, that was on our operations and our activities. And there is a much bigger picture that needs to be uh, looked at. Every single government department, municipalities, different levels of government all have to be reviewed here as well. Because um, again, back to that whole of society piece is we all have a role to play, not only in the input, to what we should do better, uh, but into our preparedness, response, and recovery. Thank you. Okay. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I'm going to follow up on a question that Peter had asked regarding priority sites regaining access to power. And I understand the point that you're making, that you don't instruct Maritime Electric on how to do their work, and they have other factors that they have to consider. Fair enough. I absolutely get that. But from the flip side of that, you have a list of priority sites that EMO has identified as priority for needing access to power, and at some point you recognize that a day has passed, two days have passed, three days have passed, and those sites that you've considered a priority don't have power, and you know that. Can you give me a sense of what actions the province took when they knew there were sites that absolutely needed power and didn't have it? Uh, again, those um, from day one, the day one um, listing of priority resources or, or sites, um, those were redone um, sometimes a couple of times a day, depending on where power was being restored. And so you would have to kind of say, okay, the, we can take that one off because now they have power, or um, you know, now we're going to add these other ones to the list. So those conversations, Maritime Electric were in our office. I think like literally two or three people uh, for the first couple of, for almost the first week, um, for the full days, and then you know they were there for half the day, whatever, and so that they could go back to their offices because. Um, again, our space had uh, generator power, so we had capability to kind of keep everyone there and host everyone there, so it was easier. Um, so, you know, the, 
it was always changing. Our health sites, for the example that I can use at best, is you know the health sites that had generator. Um, as long as we could keep fuel to them, if they had full capacity operating, um, you know they were on the list absolutely. But Maritime Electric, we're going to prioritize the, the how they got to these sites. Um, and I'm not sure if you're going to get to hear from Maritime Electric or if you have hear, heard, I'm not sure. Yeah. But I remember when I, I gave them that first listing of 200 and some sites, and their first comment to me is, well, okay, that's going to be tough because they're scattered. Those 200 sites are scattered every single where in the province. He said it would require every single line to be reactivated immediately uh, to have everybody on all those priorities. So um, so again, that, that listing, not a fine science, really tough to do. And I have to say personally, really challenging uh, decision making that has to happen with all of our people around the table to say, which one of those 50 priorities that you, we have today is going to be the number one? And it's, they're tough decisions to make, which I appreciate. I'm sure everyone around this table can, can understand and respect. Uh, but they're not easy ones. And we had to make the decision of this one, because um, we know you can get there today. You know, put all your efforts to that. And there were some of those that we did. We pushed them and said, you know, we need it, we need it on today. Um, and, you know, they might have come back to us and in certain situations says, listen, the damage is so significant. It's going to take us three days or four days to get there. Um, and in some instances, they pivoted. They stopped doing work over here and did move to doing uh, work that we were saying, no, we need it done today. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I'm debating this, but I think I'm going to have to burn my second question because I don't feel like you answered my first okay. one. I'm so sorry. I'm, so I'm, I'm sorry. I have to reiterate, I definitely understand that you don't have control over what sites Maritime Electric reactivates and that getting all lines online at the same time is not realistic. I recognize that and I can totally appreciate that. But there are other tools at your disposal, yeah. like initiating ground search and rescue, making sure they get out to folks. We've heard from long-term care centers that we're without power. Did we send out military staff to help fill those spaces? We. Did we initiate door knocks? What steps did the province take when you knew those lines weren't coming online? That's what I want to know. Oh, sorry, I may have misunderstood the question. Um, so there was there was lots of those as well. Um, and again, I will say to um, you know the the, the door knocks to um, with GSAR, you know, should have been day one um, without question. It was you know in the. Um, absurd chaos of the first couple of days of trying to wrap our heads around what was the scope of damage, uh, how bad, you know, Maritime Electric were advising it was going to take them time to assess how significant it was going to be. Um, so we were doing the same, trying to wrap our heads around, um, you know, all the scope of damage and what was going to be needed out there. So we did have GSAR out there. We had the request for federal assistance for the military folks. Uh, made the first day like it was um, I don't know what time it was but we had the letter drafted um, in advance of Dorian and we submitted it to federal government uh, the day of the morning of I think it was eight or nine o'clock that morning we had the letter sent off to the federal government uh, it took them time to get in but also we had um, other agencies and fire service like we the fire service were reporting into us and we that was one of the proactive pieces that uh, the fire marshal did in advance of the storm saying please go out and check in your communities where there is need, what is the damage, and report back to us. So they were reporting that as well. Not necessarily did we ask them to do door knocks, but um, again, knowing the fire service like I do, I would think that there was lots of proactiveness in, in communities where they could do that, where they could prioritize that work. Um, so there was there was lots happening, but absolutely acknowledging that we, we can do more, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Trish? Thank two quick ones, Sam, two quick ones. A few times that there were legislative changes that um, have been requested uh, by EMO, uh, and it just hasn't it hasn't been a priority, and those changes haven't been made. And just for clarity, I'm wondering, can you please outline what changes you've asked for um, that had a that were not made that had a direct impact on your ability to um, respond to this storm and prepare for it? Sure. So I say it was a couple of years ago, actually, when we had did our kind of our first draft, and I'm. Um, um, again, I'm not as fluent on the whole legislative change procedures, but there's always each department is 
uh, and it allowed to um, do so many pieces of legislation per house session. Um, so a couple years ago, you know, we had started the draft on that. And the focus at that time um, was around taking the stuff that was very passive, like you, uh, you may have a plan, to making it you shall have a plan. Currently, our legislation is quite old. It's, I think, dated 1999. Um, and it is very much, um, you know, agencies, departments, provincial government departments included, may um, have a plan. Um, we asked to have that embedded, including that business continuity uh, piece and requiring um, government departments to have business continuity plans, which they all do, uh, but really putting it into legislation. And I think now in uh, post Fiona, uh, there should be additional wording and language around uh, requirements to critical infrastructure and their approach to reporting, their approach to planning, and how they work uh, inside of our shops. So that's kind of my first thought is that what we even did a couple years ago we thought was pretty good, but I think the barriers, um, as you asked, is what needs to change is really the, the those critical infrastructure partners um, that we don't have direct mandate on uh, to get get them closer into us and a requirement to them. Thank, thank you. Trish? And it, and it sounds like, from what you just said, the identification that uh, uh, being able to identify criti critical infrastructure partners um, is something that is post Fiona had been identified, so not prior. Um, but one thing that you did say, um, is that the, the change that was required, um, one of the ones you just highlighted, the difference between may and shall. I just want to point out that that's a pretty easy thing to change uh, in legislation, and you can that could have been addressed quite easily uh, by the department if that is really the, the main issue. So I would like to look into that more in depth, certainly, to see why that change wasn't made. Mm -hmm. But my other question is around um, if there were any other requests made to government, for example, say, in terms of budgetary requests or funding um, needs that were identified identified by EMO where uh, priorities should have been uh, placed in advance sh to prepare better for storms? Um, I think, again, if I go back to the Dorian, one of the, the, the recommendations was augmenting our EMO staff, and again, to be able to do work like the critical infrastructure work um, and building that capacity so that piece had not been um, invested into prior to, to now. Um, We've, I don't think we uh, asked for, again, our space. That's the only other budgetary thing, is that we thought that our space was going to work. Um, it worked during Dorian. It worked during uh, COVID response. We had um, all kinds of activity in that space for the last three years that worked quite well. But we've not had the volume of people um, come into our sites as we did for Fiona. So we just recognize that we don't have the staffing capacity to run for 24 days straight, um, you know, with four staff, um, you know, we had to give people breaks, but most people weren't taking breaks, um, and you know, we need to be able to provide that. So we need more staff to be able to to affect seven-day operations, um, and that's kind of our critical thing. Um, again, space will only come with more people. Um, so that would be the only other gap that we have. Great, Thanks. Hannah. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I have a clarification question. I, I wanted to ask about the process for um, determining and rolling out financial support with the Red Cross. Um, and I know, I understand that that sits, I think it sits with social development and housing, but I'm not really sure. I don't think it's EMO that that sat with, but I just, Chair, I just Sorry. wanted to clarify. I'm not asking a question to the Chair, I'm asking a, who do I ask the question to? Okay. And I can answer. Um, okay, so so I'll use, I only have two yeah. questions. I don't want to use my questions. Saying who's like, oh, to. <laughs> Everyone's the same to questions. <laughs> same to questions. I, uh, the clarifying point. So the only um, financial program that Red Cross is doing with our department, with Justice and Public Safety, is for the Provincial uh, Disaster Financial okay. Assistance Program, like Dorian. The remainder of the Canadian Red Cross work is, is out of the contract of social development housing. Thank you. Okay, so Chair, I have two questions, oh, please, and I would like to ask them about the, the Red quick. Cross $250 financial support that was provided to all households. Um, and I'm guessing it's social development and housing that would be able to answer those questions because you're here. Um, I understand that that program, the, the request went to the Red Cross from social development and housing on the Thursday following 
the so five day, uh, six days following the hurricane, and started to roll out on the Friday. That's what the Red Cross had said in an interview. So I'd like you to confirm if that is actually the date of rollout, and I would ask why. Um, what the decision-making process was in terms of choosing the Red Cross as the partner to deliver that financial program and why it took that long to roll out, to start. So, so that is social development housing. I'm wondering yeah. if part of their presentation will speak wait. to that. Oh, okay, it's in the we, present, so. Yeah, because they're going to do a separate presentation um, uh, about their program, so, and they'll be able to speak to that directly. Do you want, you want to wait till then? Pat, do you want to wait till then? Uh, so we can... So I believe the 28th was the approximate time. We, uh, we worked with, uh, Re with uh, Red Cross uh, to put an agreement in place. They were standing up their ability to, to address some of that stuff. And I believe the agreement was signed on October the 3rd. And I think they started rolling it. Well, they had already been, they had already stood stuff up. So at that point, they were able to officially accept uh, uh, the application or begin processing applications and roll stuff out. So that okay. was the... So, Chair, can Anna? I ask if there's a presentation to come? Or can I? I obviously, we, we, there's some details we want on that. I'm hoping those details are then in that presentation. So, you want us to break and wait to go to that presentation? Do Is you that have the, the presentation? Because I, I just didn't know there was another presentation, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, um, we're going to have to wait, but it's in here. Uh, okay, hat. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, then, wanna, sorry, okay, Pat? So, so, in terms of the deck itself, it's very high level in terms of how it addresses the Red Cross. So, right. I was expecting there would be questions that would follow the deck. So, okay. it's not actively integrated into the presentation. The other thing is, I believe the Red Cross is here this afternoon, and yeah. you have opportunity to discuss with the Red Cross. Yeah, sure. My questions are my questions are about the decision making process because sure. you know the decisions in terms of the, the eligibility criteria for that would sit with the department. Right, they're not. The Red Cross doesn't make the decision on who makes that decision. That's what I'm. What I'd like to ask. So, if that's going to be an opportunity to do that next, I will. Yeah, if okay. we can get our break in and get <laughs> okay, back. So, I, well. so then, Chair, I have one question I'd like to ask Great. EMO. Then it's Thank my you. second yeah. question. Thank you. Um, we heard a lot about about the the plans and business continuity and and sort of actions and your office and staffing. Um, I think there's a couple of things. One of them is that that. Emergency measures organization are the organization that are the ones that are we expect to be there to stand up when there is an emergency. It's really concerning, really concerning to hear you talk about chaos and to talk about that you didn't think that occurred or you to plan for all the power being out at the same time in the island. I don't I don't know how your department connects with some of the work that's going on in other areas, but climate adaptation and mitigation has been one of the major themes of government writ large for years and if we don't know that we should be planning for those kind of that kind of level of intensity then we're not planning for actually emergencies and i think that it's really concerning to hear that kind of language consistently through your presentation so i, I really need to share that because i'm also hearing people on social media who are watching did you have a question saying, what the heck? sorry yes my question is one of the things i haven't heard you talk about is vulnerable populations um, and I would really like to know what specific actions you had in place to help, and not just the one emergency shelter that we had, but the longer term follow on impact on vulnerable and marginalized populations, the unhoused seniors, um, and where they appear in your priority for response after an emergency like this. Sure, so I'll, I'll just um, say as well is that that, that population is, is really managed or planned under social development housing. So again, EMO, um, we are the coordinator uh, of all those plans and documents. So uh, any of those uh, issues or plans for populations um, such as you know vulnerable populations, that shelter that was opened uh, to support that population would be social development housing. Like it's their their plan to to implement and to uh, and to manage. Are you saying this isn't an aspect of your responsibility to consider how to respond for people who are more the most vulnerable in our society? Again, we we are the we're the provincial oversight umbrella to all the plans. We basically we would be asking every single department, what's your plans to manage this? What's your plans to manage this? Um, and so that is the role that EMO has. Um, we are again 
coordinate and manage is what we do. We don't, uh, we don't respond. We ensure that provincial government departments and agencies are coordinated and are managing their respective areas of responsibility. Great. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take five minutes um, just to take a break, and then we'll come back. We'll get the, the next presentation geared up, and then we can go a little bit past 12. So I'm thinking if, if we don't get everything in, we're, we're, I'm going to set the hard cutoff at 12.10, and then that might set the next presentation back to 1.10. So take a five-minute break right now. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your time. This is very important. So we'll adjourn for five minutes.
Okay, so we're back and uh, we have, uh, uh, again, uh, staff from Social Development and Housing has already introduced himself, so we're moving on to kind of the second part of our presentation. Um, so I'll pass the floor over. Uh, we'll go through the presentation kind of as quickly as we can and then we'll have uh, a full some time, hopefully for questions and uh, answers. So pass it over to our guests. All right, um, I'm gonna take the, the lead. We uh, didn't put together an intro slide, but we did decide that we would respond kind of in relatively literal fashion to the letter that we received. So the order of the deck talks about how did we come up with our priorities? What did we do by way of preparedness? Then we talk about what it is that the divisions kind of worked on individually because each actually has slightly different responsibility. Then we kind of wrap up with, um, with uh, some of the, the financial supports that went out and then some lessons learned type, um, type stuff. So we, um, we do have a uh, departmental uh, business continuity plan that actually integrates and rolls kind of in with the, uh, the provincial uh, business continuity strategy or, or plan, I guess, probably the better description. Um, the interesting component of that plan is initially it actually contemplates about a 72 hour window that we need to be available to support for. And typically the tabletop exercises that we've done, um, the majority of the event is usually completed within that 72 hours, even though there may be other lingering effects that might run on for the period of a week. Um, so when we talk about things that we're prepared, prepared for, typically it's providing uh, supports for people that are in vulnerable situations, um, looking at employee safety and wellness, how is it that we can deliver services on a priority basis, and how is it that we can make sure that we deploy our resources uh, uh, right away. Um, to be honest, the majority of the table talk exercises, in addition to making sure that uh, things like uh, child and family services are looked after, that, uh, that we're in a position to do building assessments and things like that within that 72 hour period for housing services, also typically focuses quite a bit on uh, how it is that we deliver uh, social assistance in that short amount of time, uh, since that represents often the, the payment for that person. Um, so that, that's also part of the plan. How do we communicate some of this information? So uh, a good example actually would have been that our check, the delivery of uh, payments was actually interrupted for check day. So how the Canada Post wasn't actually able to make the deliveries. Uh, so how was it that we were going to stand up and people would know where it is that they could get the financial supports that they were expecting that the province would deliver at that time? How is it that we work with stakeholders, partners, and communities to respond to some of the needs? And then what is it that we do with respect to our, our structure? So we can move on. Um, so before the storm, one of the first things we did actually was look how would we minimize disruptive to the social programs payment system. Um, this, was, uh, this was one of the key items because uh, one item that we actually didn't have really any conversation about was that on September 30th was actually the payment date for social assistance payments. So uh, staff was adamant that payments were prepared, put in envelopes, and made available in the event that, that, um, that there was a disruption to uh, power since we weren't sure how that would impact the mail system. And that was actually down at the line staff making sure that everybody knew that we couldn't wait until Monday or Tuesday to stuff envelopes, that they wanted to have the stuff packed and ready to go. So we worked with finance to make sure that the electronic payments were sitting at the bank with the future date for payment for those that would receive by EFT and that the checks were available and in the mail room at the, like down at the complex and that they were ready to go to Canada Post if they were available. And if Canada Post wasn't available, the reason they didn't go to Canada Post was in the event that they weren't available, that we would have to roll out to staff. And I have to say that of all the planning things that we've always done on tabletop exercises, that is one that actually worked very well. And there were, I don't believe, many complaints about how it is that that rolled out. That we had people at offices to deliver payments, and I think Asali's gonna comment that in other circumstances, we actually had people do drop-offs where we found out that people weren't able to get there. Uh, so the other item that we prepared in terms of our identified as priorities, we're preparing storm shelter and supports for people experiencing homelessness. We look to mitigate damage to government owned property and ensure that properties with generators were functioning and fueled. Um, knowing some of the comments that come out some, sometimes when we talk about property, people and things along those lines, here where we're talking about property, we're actually talking about making sure that the government buildings that we do have, such as housing buildings, are, are set up and available to support people to the extent that is possible. That included doing things, and I'm sure Jason will get this, like making sure that loose stuff is put away, that things are fuel, that things are ready to roll. Um, we made sure that uh, we identified as a priority that uh, children's group homes would have access to food and medications if it was required. 
We made contingency plans for staffing. We contacted our NGOs to make sure that uh, if there were things that they were going to need that we were aware. And we had HR, we had spoken with HR and confirmed with staff that additional staff were prepared to respond uh, if needed. So our department is responsible for making sure that our emergency services are delivered and if people need to be retasked from their regular jobs to deliver supports with Child and Family Services, to make sure the checks are available to be delivered, whatever it is that we need to do that they may be asked to do things that were outside the ordinary. So again, so within the actual steps that we took place, so we enacted the, the, uh, the plan that included having divisional leaders meet and roll things out to their staff. Uh, we made sure that our support officer with uh, EMO was made available. We did fan out lists to make sure that staff contacts were current. We identified the risks, most of which we've already mentioned. Uh, we contacted some foster parents. And then after that, we also scheduled daily business continuity follow-up calls for the period immediately following the storm. Those calls were booked at noon. This let the uh, few staff that we have that were participating at the EMO office, so we had up to three people staffed at the EMO office at any given time uh, to meet some of the needs. So one directly with, uh, with the EMO folks, the other folks to kind of stick handle calls and inquiries that were rolling in from us. Um, so we made sure that those folks were available for the 8 o'clock briefing. They had another call with us. If things could wait until then, they provided us with the briefing at that time. We also provided those folks with uh, business continuity information, and that business continuity detail rolled up and forward through to EMO. So if that, that included identifying like which uh, group homes might not still have power, which houses which, or which uh, locations may not have power, and to make sure that they were available in the event that they could be prioritized for being uh, supported that they were. So those are at a very high level, the steps that took. And so I'm going to speak uh, first on behalf of Child and Family Services. So in preparation for the storm, uh, our Child and Family Services Division worked with Housing Services to confirm that our buildings, so our group home facilities, were prepared for the storm. Uh, those locations with generators, uh, they were fueled and functioning. Uh, as Pat already mentioned, we made sure that all our group homes had additional supplies on hand, that their vehicles were fueled, so things like children's medication, uh, first aid, emergency supplies. We were in contact with foster families in advance of the storm as well to ensure that uh, they had what they needed uh, and that they were as well aware of contingency plans, like if uh, chil uh, children in care were supposed to go to other visits, what would happen uh, in case of, um, in case of uh, that being delayed. We also put staff on notice, as we mentioned already, to be prepared to uh, do emergency duty if required and to identify potential requirements if we needed additional staffing supports. Uh, our Emergency duty workers were also stocked as well with backup uh, battery packs, uh, phones, things like that in case of interruptions uh, to their ability to do their work. During and after, our foster families were immediately contacted again uh, following the storm, again to determine how they were doing, uh, how the children in their care were doing. We had one group home that was uh, significantly de uh, delayed in having power returned. It was a relatively small group home, so we made alternate arrangements for those uh, children to move to another location. Uh, and we were obviously checking in with our group homes on a regular basis, and uh, supervisors and staff were in regular contact. Uh, on behalf of social programs, so as Pat mentioned already, um, the monthly check run or monthly uh, check was uh, was our uh, priority uh, on the um, up front. So we ensured that electronic payments were processed prior to the storm, that those checks were printed prior to the storm. That was all done, ready to go. Uh, during and after the storm, we staffed our offices for clients to pick up the checks. Uh, we also made arrangements uh, when individuals weren't in to pick up their checks. We were calling, making sure that uh, we were in touch with people, letting them know that their checks were there, and also <clears throat> delivering checks, as Pat mentioned, in some cases. We distributed emergency payments to over 4,800 households on social programs. So we had staff in working weekends after hours to make sure that we could deliver those payments as quickly as possible. We contacted uh, 1,100 Seniors Independence Initiative uh, recipients about accessing the emergency support payments. Um, we used this as an opportunity to call each of our um, clients or recipients directly to check in after the storm as well. So workers, um, again, worked after hours and on weekends to do that. We relaunched the Seniors Grocery Voucher Program with over 17,000 grocery vouchers having been issued to date. And we partnered with our uh, with the Department of Education and Lifelong Learning to administer uh, the child care allowance for school closures as well. 
Um, yeah, so on the, the housing side, um, in preparation for, for the hurricane, um, first of all, our maintenance staff was uh, monitoring and checking the weather forecasts uh, on a daily basis to kind of track, track the storm. Uh, maintenance staff uh, went out and ensured that all our generators that we had in, in, in the facilities were working and fueled. Um, our maintenance staff visited all of our buildings to ensure that any loose items, um, drainage and gutters and all that were cleared and in an attempt to kind of mitigate the damage to, to the facility. Um, in the days leading up to the hurricane, um, our staff set up the emergency shelter to support individuals experiencing homelessness at the Jack Blanchard Hall. Um, so that happened uh, two or three or four days in advance of the storm. So that planning process started. We also secured an overflow location um, in the event that it would be needed. Um, and we used a, kind of a collaborative approach uh, with our community partners to staff create a staffing model between government staff and the community partners to uh, allow that uh, facility to function safely um, during and after the hurricane our, our housing staff uh, completed regular site visits to our to our housing location um, locations uh, with a focus on the properties that uh, experienced extended power outages. Some of our properties came on, came back on relatively quick. There were several that were delayed uh, over a week. So those were the ones we, we spent most of our time on, but we did kind of do regular site visits at all of our seniors' locations. Uh, we provided some types of supplies, such as flash lights that were provided uh, to, the, to the tenants to uh, just provide some more light. Um, there was some significant damage to one of our, not our government-owned properties, but one of our leased properties that we, uh, that we have our tenants in. So our staff worked uh, very hard to relocate those tenants into, uh, into a hotel accommodation for a temporary basis until that, uh, until that facility can be repaired. Um, maintenance staff spent the initial period after the storm assessing the initial the initial damages uh, prioritizing the cleanup and the repairs that would be needed um, which also included going through the uh, risk management and insurance claim process F from damage perspective we had uh, relatively minor damage to s the majority of our properties not a whole lot of significant structural damage so so we were kind of uh, happy with that um, one of the other things our staff did was uh, very important was to track the the, the fuel left in the generators that we had in our facilities to make sure that once they get to a certain point um, that they would uh, be refueled. They have an automatic ping system to the supplier, so um, that was just a double double check to make sure that, uh, that everything was being refueled uh, as planned. Um, we were able to collaborate with other government departments uh, to assist with uh, the cleanup of downed trees, so we were able to work with the Parks Department, transportation, which was extremely helpful to expedite the, the tree cleanup process. Um, we had our staff in regular communication with our department rep representatives at EMO in an attempt to prioritize Maritime Electric's uh, efforts to reconnect some power to some of those senior senior facilities that uh, were without power for an extended period of time. Um, there were so, some areas that were were hardest hit by Fiona, so those took a little bit longer, obviously, to get reconnected. Um, we were able to coordinate the delivery of food to our to the emergency shelters and the community outreach center as well. Um, so on the on our departmental actions, so as I mentioned, we and I think Pat mentioned as well, we had up to three staff. Um, working with the MO on a daily basis to ensure that the department uh, needs were identified. Um, we had business continuity calls completed on a daily basis uh, to receive updates and to provide uh, clarity as to what the priorities uh, should be for our division and our department. Um, our deputy minister and minister were involved in a, in a cabinet subcommittee on social p p supports um, and our senior management team was uh, heavily involved in leadership in the field. Um, staff were also re redeployed, as uh, Pat mentioned, from other divisions as needed. For example, we had social program staff that volunteered to uh, assist with the operations of our emergency shelters to support uh, individuals uh, facing homelessness. Uh, we arranged for uh, school food program meals to be redistributed to warming centers where schools were closed to support uh, local families and communities. 
Um, from the financial supports perspective, we were able to uh, announce uh, within uh, five days of uh, the hurricane $5 million in emergency funding being made available. So it provides on the screen there, it provides a breakdown of the, the funding. So there was $825,000 allocated to social assistance and assured income clients. We had $225,000 allocated to the senior seniors independence initiative clients. We had $510,000 allocated to our social housing clients, and that includes uh, individuals that are on our mobile rental voucher program. It includes our senior clients and includes our family clients as well. Uh, we have the additional relaunching of the grocery voucher program uh, allocated to seniors in the amount of two million. Um, we provided $200,000 to the Adventure Group to uh, support NGOs that uh, assist or to address the needs of individuals experiencing homelessness. Uh, we had $500,000 allocated to United Way to provide funding to NGOs to, who directly support people impacted. Uh, $500,000 was allocated towards food banks across Prince Edward Island, and $240,000 was uh, allocated to residential NGOs as well. We also had approximately $18 million in uh, Fiona Recovery Fund, so that's the $250 emergency payment per household that was funded by our, our department. That's, yep. uh, so we, wanted, we felt it really important to note uh, just some key findings uh, from uh, certainly at the outcome of this storm. Uh, our staff de demonstrated a significant dedication and commitment to the individuals that they served. You've heard us all talk about staff going above and beyond, and um, we would be remiss if we didn't certainly recognize that. Uh, there was strong coordination from volunteers with other government departments to support emergency shelter, uh, the emergency shelters for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, there was effective coordination and distribution of uh, the $5 million in emergency support payments internally and through our NGO organizations. Uh, and then there was effective coordination through uh, the emergency operations centers, as uh, Tanya talked about, uh, for our departmental response. In terms of lessons learned and next steps, uh, our uh, Pat mentioned this right at the start, but our business continuity plan will be reviewed and extended for situations beyond 72 hours. Uh, we are um, exploring the further development of our, our comprehensive disaster management plan. Uh, we're looking to streamline the process to issue emergency payments to clients. Uh, we want to ensure that we enhance the preparedness of our housing tenants as well. Uh, we are looking to develop a flagging system for social programs clients to identify those with highest risk. Uh, it's important that we work uh, and continue to do so, work collaboratively with other departments to explore opportunities for service and community partnerships. Again, uh, important that we work with municipalities, EMO, and community partners to better define roles in emergency responses. We are conducting a review of our backup generator inventory, and we continue to work towards moving our clients towards electronic payments. And finally, um, we look to enhance the coordination with our community partners to support individuals experiencing homelessness. Perfect. Thank you very much for that presentation. So what we'll do is, um, so we have, we have both um, uh, EMO and social development here, so there might be some questions here and there are weaved in, so just, just be ready in the fire marshal too. Uh, I'll start with Rob. Yeah, okay, no, appreciate uh, the information here in this regard and the findings. It's good to pat yourself a bit on the back in that regard. But I, I would say if I was one of the individuals that happened uh, on the food voucher, seniors food voucher program, I think there was, what, a day or two that somehow the, there was an error in the loading of the cards, and uh, I had a couple of constituents that showed up at the Larry Farmers Co-op mm -hmm. and had no money and food <laughs> and had to put it all back. Yeah. So what happened there? Can you explain what, what the, the gap or the error that occurred there and, and uh, how was it rectified? So, so there, was an, there was an error in the back end processing in terms of the assignment of cards to individuals. It was on the IT side. Uh, it wasn't something that we had actually visibility to, uh, to review and confirm. Um, so uh, as soon as we found out that, the, that it was an issue, it was actually at four o'clock on Friday evening. Uh, that there was an issue. We actually had a number of emergency calls and spent the, uh, the entire next day uh, reissuing uh, payments for people that received the information by, uh, so that that information went out by email. Uh, for anybody that had an email payment and that uh, 
made sure that we had stuff reprinted for anybody that had paper and anybody that was identified as receiving paper, and that was actually about half the affected individuals, they actually all received phone calls. So we called everybody within actually within about a four hour period. So there were a number of government departments that got together to actually fan out and call, call everyone and make sure that uh, as many people as possible receive the information. So how many did that happen to and, and how, that will never happen again is what we're saying? <laughs> <laughs> never say never, but, uh, but uh, IT did, uh, so they're making some programming changes to the back end so that it's, uh, it's uh, far more unlikely that it will happen. The other thing that is also, that they've also, ch the other change that they have made was actually to provide us with some reporting that would enhance visibility. So uh, th those card numbers and PIN numbers aren't, a, aren't visible to staff like in bulk. Uh, and that's what actually would have picked up the issue. But there actually is a separate kind of client ID number or a card ID number that doesn't disclose private information. So again, that's to make sure that um, it's to reduce opportunity for th fraud or theft. Uh, so anyway, there is another way to actually, there will be another way to manually confirm that there aren't duplicate cards being issued and that was the end source of that problem. Hmm. Rob, I'll get another question. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm kind of going back to maybe uh, Tanya Mullally a bit because uh, I had more that I wanted to get through there. Um, I guess I, I heard some comments about disaster medicine management and having a specialist play a role in that and uh, maybe to help with mitigation and response. And I do see you have health down as one of the critical areas of infrastructure, but h how were uh, emergency rooms impacted? Uh, were surgeries postponed, treatments postponed? Uh, and I certainly get during the duration of the storm that 24, 36 hour period, but was there impacts beyond that and what's the plan to make sure that that didn't happen? So anything with all those specific questions, I would have to say you'd have to ask Health PEI. I do know that Health PEI does have a representative into our operations center and I would just, I'd have to go back to our all, all our situation reports that we did daily just to kind of get an understanding of what that was. Um, but they do have representation and uh, submit all that kind of work. But as to the specifics, that would be a health PI questions. But do they have expert, do they have expertise from your perspective, or what what were you missing on that? I'm not, so. I'm not sure. If, uh, again, I, I know that the comment that you're referencing about the disaster management specialist, um, you know, that's again, I think that would be. Health PEI um, strategy they could be looking at, and I don't know how they manage their kind of their backside of their their operations. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that would be um, a, an absolute resource available to them that's embedded right into their emergency department uh, that they could leverage that information to help them make better informed decisions during an event. Um, we again that that departmental rep that comes into us, they're they're like the filtering liaison point. Uh, from the department to our shop. Um, so, again, a, a question best posed for them. Yeah. Rob? But I guess my point is, so, so you're as the EMO specialist in determining what the plans are, and if you're identifying a gap or you're feeling that you don't get the expertise that you require, I'm not ex asking you to know all of these, you know, these critical uh, pieces of uh, information and infrastructure that you require. So you're really left at the mercy of, say, Health PEI. This is the representative they're giving you, and that's all the information I get. So you're really, your hands are tied. And I guess, again, y yes, if that's how you want to look at it, but, um, you know, we're the emergency management specialist. I didn't identify that, that there was a gap there. I think the, the social media point that I reference, I think, was an individual that indicated that they felt that was the gap. Um, I can't speak to what Health PEI um, identified as a gap. I'm just telling you that that's how the reporting uh, chain works. Okay. Well, last comment or anything? Well, well if you, I, Carla? I have more questions, but I'll let the others okay. have a go up. Put me on okay, the list again. For, for, uh, Carla? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you for, for a couple of things. One, having the the foresight to plan for the social assistance to get those envelopes stuffed and have a plan for if ABC happens, this is what we do. Thank you. The second thing is going into the ensuring, keeping in touch with the group homes and the foster homes. Thank you for that. Those are two massive thanks. I see a whole lot of discrepancies in other areas. So under your the actions that you listed that your department took, the ground being on the ground showed a much different story. And I know I only have three questions, but I have more like a million, so we'll save some of those for later. Um, so on Sunday, the hurricane was Friday. Sunday, 
Annabelle came and picked me up. We hopped in her car and we went to the emergency shelter. I'd been there when they were helping set up. I was in regular contact with them until I didn't have cell service. So we went to see how they were doing. When we walked in, the Deputy Minister for Social Development and Housing, as well as, I'm not sure of her title, but the Homelessness Coordinator were there helping serve lunch and they were packing up on Sunday. Sunday. So Hannah and I were there. Hannah had cell reception, picked up her phone, called the minister. The minister had no idea, apparently, that the shelters were closing and said that that was an EMO decision to close them. So obviously they were still needed on Sunday. You say that people who are unhoused are a huge part of your plan. Can you explain how they were a huge part of your plan and how you ensured the ongoing shelter when EMO was shutting down the shelter? I think there might be a little bit of miscommunication there. So uh, that the, the, the ending of the shelter that Jack Blanchard was it was our social development housing responsibility. We had another site set up uh, at the Murphy's uh, rec center there uh, as the overflow. Um, originally, the plan was to have that space open over the weekend. Um, but as the storm evolved, uh, the decision was made to extend that and relocate to the Murphy's Center as the Jack Blanchard Hall was potentially not going to be available. Carla? Thank you, Chair. Well, that's wonderful. But why was the person in charge of the shelter not aware of that? How, why, was it, why was that simplest thing not communicated? I can't speak to the information that you received. Um, I, I was speaking I to the organizer. The person who was in charge of the shelters had no idea that that shelter was shutting and that they were moving to Murphy Center. So I don't want to waste we'll my second question. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't want to waste, I, I think that was a huge failure on the part of the department. Um, the second I thing that- I, Did you have a chance to answer that? Uh, I'm not sure how, like, I, I guess I would need to know exactly what you were referring to. I'm not sure exactly uh, the communication that would have happened between the person on the ground and yourself. Okay. I think it's pretty yeah. straightforward. The person yeah. in charge of the shelter had no idea it was closing and that it was moving, period. Um, the second thing, um, after having kind of, as information rolled in and things were coming to our attention, and um, I, I popped in to visit a couple of seniors in, in my district and they had their power back on at that point and kind of started to branch out because of seniors I know in other areas and across the province would, would share a very similar story. And I'm not going to get into the pre-Fiona issues that we have with our public seniors housing that has been abandoned by the department for several years. Um, so we knew the state of our buildings going into this, yet we were okay with having no emergency lightings in the hallway where many of, I, many of the roofs are leaking. So there's already puddles on the floor on a good day. And some seniors play, our homes don't, or public uh, independent seniors living apartments don't even have railings along the wall. So when I went in, I went in on the Wednesday, some of them hadn't had anything to eat, a warm meal since Friday. They had thrown their food out on Sunday. Sorry, Chair, I know I'm rambling. Um, so when I went in, um, I, they, were, they told me that people from the department had been around with bags for the garbage. What was, would you have checked on the well-being of the seniors above and beyond offering bags? I know I hear different, I know there was one person, I was at, at one senior's apartment complex for three full days, and there was one person from housing that was on site the whole time I was there, other than the two that ripped through the hallways to pass bags. So what were your plans to support the people? You are the landlords. What, what did you have in place to support your tenants? Because this is this when you lose power and you lose all of those things, that's not a tenant responsibility, that's a landlord responsibility. You say you were keeping tabs on the fuel in the in the generators, but yeah. they ran out. We just so did, yeah. what was your plan? Um, when would you have intervened in seniors' homes that were left without power for that long? So, I mean, we began our process uh, internally to have st housing staff visit the sites uh, on a daily basis. So all of, like the sites that you're probably referring to, we had staff on the ground on a daily basis to do door knocks on the tenants. We visited the tenants. We have 
We have records of, of those visits. Um, so tenants. On the maintenance side, we recognize that uh, the buildings are aged and do need significant repairs. We did all we could to uh, try and make those buildings safe. The power outages extended far beyond uh, the traditional, uh, <coughs> traditionally what Charlottetown loses in terms of power. On a, usually they'd lose it you know, for a couple days max. This is well, well extended beyond that. The buildings that we currently kind of re you're probably referring to don't have backup generators in there because typically they you know wouldn't lose power for an extended period of time that's kind of obviously one of the lessons learned that we have here and a and we're doing a, a thorough review of of our facilities and what it may take to put generators uh, fully functional backup generators into facilities um, but that's a that's kind of a lesson learned that we have uh, internally to work through last one Thank you, I Chair. I would love to dig in on that, but I'm going to ask well, my lap I, I, because I'm limited to three. So another thing that we saw were island tenants displaced from their homes, roofs ripped off, various things. Um, so having substantial damage to their housing. Um, why didn't the government roll out any targeted assistance programs to support tenants? In terms of repairs or in terms of general and just in general? Well, anything any sort of financial support for tenants. So we did launch uh, our $5 million financial support. So that was, from a housing perspective, it was $150 per household um, that we have under our social housing clients, both MRVs, tenants, seniors, and family. But so that was launched. Okay. I, I was speaking about okay. tenants. Okay, so Michelle. I'm gonna jump right off that because there were tenants that were displaced and they weren't your clients. Mm -hmm. So how did you support tenants that weren't your clients when they had nowhere to go? Uh, we were sp we were specifically targeting our social health, housing and de social development and housing clients. I can't speak to other other housing clients that are just in regular market housing. It would be Michelle. Thank you. And a comment on that. This was an absolute disaster zone where unprecedented measures needed to be taken. So when people are displaced from their homes, these are people who have never asked for help before because they've never needed it. That was a huge gap with no tenants having any kind of financial assistance to even move, try to salvage their things. They were completely ignored in the whole in this whole process, unless they were a client. I want to touch a little bit more on the seniors' housing. So yes, you did have somebody there. I was there when she was there. But the, the generator stopped while I was in those hallways. I can't tell you, can't even be able to explain to you the darkness in that building that those seniors were dealing with. My 13-year-old was with me delivering care packages to them, and she wanted to go back the next day because she knew that they were not being adequately taken care of. She's 13. And she knew that they were not being helped or protected two weeks into the recovery of the storm. So my question to you is, is what responsibilities does the department as landlords have towards the tenants in public housing? I mean, as from our perspective, like, as you mentioned, we are the landlord, but we do have when, when we when we recognize that the power was going to be out for an extended period of time. We had our staff uh, do regular door knocks to ensure that they were that the tenants were uh, had someone to talk to at least and identify their problems. We also worked collaboratively with with our department staff at EMO to uh, have EMO send out you know ground search and rescue as well. Those those were initiatives as well. We had the coordination of uh, some food as well delivered uh, through EMO. So I mean, those were the the things that we. We did from our perspective to help out the, the tenants in our buildings recognizing that it would you know another big part of it was trying to uh, encourage or try to get an idea of the timeline and when power would be restored Michelle thank you chair clarifying question from something EMO shared with us one of the scenarios was the power would be out for two weeks were you aware that that was potentially what was going to happen in this storm as a, the Department of Social Development and Housing, did you know that it could be a two-week response to get power back? Well, I think, like, as Pat, you can take that one, Pat. Yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd received some briefings with some estimates for times being out along with the amount of time we could there. Um, to be honest, in most, most of the other circumstances where we ran into uh, 
extended power delays or extended outages as Tanya indicated previously, they were in pockets, so it wasn't everywhere out all the time. Um, and so in terms of the, the capacity to actually pick up and expect that, so statistically, when's the last time the trial town lost power for two weeks? Never in my experience. Uh, so, you know, while it was possible that parts of the province may be without power for two weeks, I don't think it was the expectation that the entire province or the majority of the province would be would, would have that amount of work effort required over a two-week period. Okay, thanks. Okay, Michelle, and then uh, Kyle and I are trying to look right here. But I see, I I see that. I can just I'll keep asking questions until you're done. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, so you. We have listed here that you arranged the school food program meals to be redistributed redistributed to warming centers. So I spent a lot of time at the Stratford Warming Center. Um, for It wasn't until Tuesday that that actually happened, and it was one meal, and I believe it was done on Tuesday and Wednesday, and that was it. And I think that they put out 250 meals, and that was also being distributed distributed into seniors in the community because the town of Stratford and I were actually identifying vulnerable seniors at risk and who those most could potentially go to. So what, how many of those food, um, food program locations were actually making food and was it only one meal a day that they were producing? So on this, this, the school food end of things, so a number of the school food vendors were negatively impacted. Of course, they were without power. Uh, so and while school wasn't in place, they were not they weren't producing food. So as power came back on, uh, they so and a number of those producers also didn't have access to didn't have generators, and they also had a, a large amount of food waste, and they needed to be in a position to replenish their food. So when uh, schools were to reopen, um, emergency uh, efforts were taken to make sure that the schools that were open would have food and that there would be food produced in an equivalent amount for the schools that that were not going to reopen. And for the schools that did not reopen, the most efficient way to deliver those meals were to, to deliver to community, uh, to communities, and in, in particular to areas that were being used as warming centers. And people were made aware that that was the case in the food. So, so after the produ food production started, um, then if there was a, an area where a school was closed, food would be, would be potentially routed to, to that area. But when the schools came back online, then the food for that uh, that reception area would have dried up, but those meals would have then been routed directly to the school where, those, where the children would have received them instead. Last one. Yeah, yeah, just to point out, you know, Stratford had over a thousand people, close to fifteen hundred people, come in there on on Monday, and there was no food like that. That was not something that was part of your preparedness because that wasn't ready to turn on on Monday and that was a location that actually had a generator and was up and running. So that was an afterthought and probably not par part of your original plan, which is kind of what this allows it to so say. I so was there any discussion of having extended time so you could actually provide maybe one or two, like more than one meal a day so in think, those locations? I think that in our lessons learned, one of the items that's indicated in there is about the role of our part of the other partners. So so in, in uh, uh, my understanding in terms of the EMO, and perhaps Tanya can clarify, is that uh, normally community would deliver services at a community level. And in the event that the community is not in a position to deliver that service, then they would reach out. And, uh, and then the province would then identify ways in which the province would turn around and deliver additional services. So the idea or the contemplation that social development and housing would be responsible for delivering meals to warming centers all across the province is not part of our emergency plan. Uh, and it may end up being that, that it's somewhere within the entire EMO realm of things that there is a plan or a strategy that's put in place for how it is that gets activated. Uh, but it, it was it was a capacity that we have that we believe would make a difference at the time, and and so as a result, it was deployed. If it hadn't been available, it wouldn't have been deployed. So. Okay, so we have Rob, Carla, Lynn, Hannah. Rob. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one may be a little bit more for uh, Tanya again too. Um, 
I guess it's more of an observation, but I, it seemed like the armed forces, when they were called in, um, maybe you can explain, like, it seemed like we were behind the, a little bit on that. Nova Scotia seemed to have that made that announcement earlier. I'm not saying that that is actually the case. That was a perception. But maybe you could uh, fill me in a little bit about when those decisions were made, what's that process, and, and as well as, is there stipulations? In other words, is there a cost to the province to uh, get that service to come in, or, or how all that works? So just to elaborate a bit more on that issue. Sure. Um, I, I can't speak to the Nova Scotia timelines of how and how they moved and at what pace and, and where and when, but I do know that, um, again, I had mentioned before that we do have a provincial, our provincial liaison officer to um, Canadian Armed Forces that are work right in our office. Uh, so um, if I would go back to my notes, I think I know on the on the Friday, um, we did have a conversation with our Canadian Armed Forces and even with Public Safety Canada just in regards to kind of putting out a soft notice that we would probably be looking to make a request uh, for additional resources. And just to clarify that when we ask the federal government for additional resources at, the, at that level, we don't ask for the military. We ask for, we need, 50 personnel to help clean off roads or prioritize this or do whatever effect. Uh, so we ask for the effect. They determine uh, what is the most effective and available resource. Um, and it often, in large batches, comes through in a military presence. Um, so when we put out that request, we were actually one of we were one of three provinces that put in uh, a request all at the same time. So Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and PEI were all putting that ask, and then Public Safety Canada had to take it back and kind of figure out what were the resources they had closest and deployed out. Again, I think Nova Scotia was a little bit ahead of the game. Um, just from in timelines, they were also hit about four or five hours, so I don't know how they managed to get uh, the request in earlier, but. So that is kind of the, the triggering. The first request went in. The re no, uh, federal government responded to it. We were second request. They responded to us as well. Um, and then there's the deployment time to get them here, which was a couple of days perspective. Mm -hmm. Rob? Is there a cost to the province on that? Or how, how does that all work Sorry. as far as, uh, so I get the, the request is made, but uh, and I'm, I'm confident money's not the issue per se, but just I'm just wondering how that uh, decision gets made based on costs. Right, so, uh, sorry, I didn't answer that question. Um, we don't make the request based on, on, um, on, I won't say not on money, but you know, we know that there's something that we need and we just ask the federal government for it. They, I believe, could send an invoice. Uh, to my knowledge, it's, it, it hasn't occurred. That's kind of what the federal government will look and say, what is the best, most efficient resource that they have available and to provide support. And I think early days from federal government and from um, the Minister of Public Safety federally uh, and the Premier said, whatever resources we have, we're happy to share them with you and s to support the provinces. Mm -hmm. So no, no cost to my knowledge yet. Okay, Rob? Okay, uh, another question I have is a bit more, maybe not so much for housing, but as much as the uh, cleanup. Th so the province made an announcement for seniors and people with disability for homes for cleanup. And, uh, you know, there was a 1-800 number to call at uh, the, or the local access center. Um, obviously, I kind of mentioned that to a number of my constituents, uh, Facebook, things of that nature. Anyway, uh, people made inquiries about that, and uh, I'm going to say four weeks later, um, I happened to put a little tweet out here last week uh, that, you know, I had a, one constituent uh, that uh, was four weeks later and still couldn't get out. Uh, then all of a sudden I got a whole lot of calls. My, my issue was is that the process was to contact Access PEI. Uh, Access PEI was basically just the, the handle of the phone calls, and I could never find out who was actually the organization that was actually going to remove these trees to allow these people access to their properties. And uh, from a safety perspective. So I, you know, I, I made some calls to Access PI. I'm just saying, who can I get this information to on this one particular individual who called me to say, I'm still waiting and I have no contact to say when they'll arrive. Wouldn't give that information to me as an MLA, which is fine. So I said, well, then you convey the message on to uh, the appropriate people. Still, nothing happened. 
And I find out a little later that it was transportation, so I check with transportation. No, we never get any contact on anybody. <laughs> so there was a lot of miscommunication just in that particular pro I know that's after, but uh, you know, you're sort of saying that tree cleanup requests are part of EMO, so I'm just trying to get some sense. So how did that terribly uh, messaged program get people to the spot? Now in the end, the department never did show up. It showed up, but the, it was the neighbors came and cleaned the ladies' uh, uh, trees away. But that, that was an error. You can't announce programs and not be able to deliver them, I guess, is the bottom line. And as EMO, you must have to have some influence in making sure these programs are at least meet expectations, or reasonably so. So, so it is Department of Transportation. Um, that, that it was their initiative uh, and program. So, and I can't speak to, um, you know, what chain of communication was provided to access staff and, and back and forth. But it was a Department of Transportation initiative um, that they were developing uh, in advance of the storm um, to have at the ready and then to be able to implement. But I can't speak to how that's being delivered. Hmm. Well, just to clarify that, okay. I, I, like I said before, uh, Dorian, I know in talking to transportation afterwards, they said, well, Dorian, the calls went directly to their department, not through Access PEI. So, and, and in my discussion with Access PEI and Larry, they said, all oh, our role was just to take the phone calls. And we were waiting for somebody to come and get the names. So, Access PEI falls underneath transportation. Yeah, I know, the so, same department. So, yeah, yeah. So it is the same department. But, but that was just an example that wasn't thought out well enough. So, okay. anyway, thanks. Chair. Okay, so uh, Sydney's on the list, so we'll put uh, we'll put it over Sydney, and then Chair, and thank you again. Um, just on the the maintenance staff side of things for senior homes or affordable housing, I understand that uh, we may have been, you know, it was unfortunate timing being understaffed going into it. Um, what's the plan now, kind of going forward as far as you know the 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 areas in, in my district uh, happen to have backup power. Um, but there's more things that need to be done as far as getting it into each individual units, that kind of thing. What's the plan going forward for for staffing up as far as maintenance is concerned uh, for these places, or hiring contractors, that that type of thing, so that yep. you know that they're ready to go for the, the next situation. Yeah. So I mean, from a housing services perspective, our maintenance staff we have about uh, 12 maintenance staff uh, on board right now for 104 seniors buildings so we are undermanned um, we have actually several job postings right now out to try and uh, entice people to come work in our on our maintenance team it is a challenge uh, there's a lot of trades people out there that uh, you know they're busy they have jobs you know it's hard to attract uh, individuals to come uh, from the private sector at this point um, in addition to that, contractors are, are difficult to come by as well. But we have good working relationship with con a lot of contractors, and um, kind of we're working towards a process of, you know, a prioritization of all our buildings um, and determining if generators, backup generators, could be uh, easily installed in some of these buildings, and for the more difficult ones, kind of what the what the cost would be to upgrade a lot of the electrical work inside some of these older buildings to uh, have a backup generator that would be fully functional um, as opposed to one that just uh, kind of has the hallway lighting in the common area so that work is under underway in our department uh, right now i'll just add in terms of uh, contemplation as well the thing to consider as we move uh, away from fossil fuels and towards electrification is the sizing of the generators that we require to support uh, a fully functioning uh, building especially if it's in the winter time and a building has electric heat um, that that our current buildings are not kind of scoped out and built built to support that and the size of the generator that would be required is substantially different than the size of a generator that's required to provide uh, support a heating system that's that's run by pro propane or, uh, or oil so there's another consideration that we have as we roll through with a number of so like this this project in part dovetails with uh, some green, other greening projects that we have underway as well so like those whole things need to, to be considered at the same time. Sydney? Thank you, Chair. And as far as an inventory of, of you know, the, the problems that, you know, we, obviously there's problems going into the storm too, but, you know, the hierarchy of things that are going to get done, how fast can you, you know, make an inventory of those things that, that have to be, to be done? And, you know, is it even possible to get that done, like, this fall or, or, or this winter? And, 
to put a put a fully functional generator system in, in a lot of the bigger buildings would, would be a longer term project. It, it, a lot of the, the lead time on just acquiring the generators is pretty significant. Um, so it, it is a it is a project that we're undertaking here from our department. But it is it is there might be some avenues to do some work in in the near future to address some some items. But you know, having a fully functional generator in, in every one of our buildings is is a long term project. City. Thank you, Chair. I understand there was some uh, uh, municipalities that, you know, in smaller areas that, uh, um, you know, f for example, if a, a, a senior's home had a backup uh, a generator but didn't have power to each individual spot and then one of the people in there needed oxygen, right, and, and that kind of thing. So they, they went and, and, and got, you know, local electricians, people to go in and, and uh, you know, hook up things for people. Um, can we be confident that those bills that were incurred will be covered by your department, even though they're they're one-offs and they weren't part of like a you know routine maintenance or something? There are bills out there. Is that are you looking at that to make sure that that's covered for you know either whoever the the tradespeople that were in there or municipalities that that called them to 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 kind of help out in that first week? Are you referring to uh, seniors in our in our buildings? Or, yes. Yeah, I think we would certainly review that. I'm not familiar with uh, any of those particular cases, so if you want to bring them forward, we can take a look. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so we're going to go to uh, Lynn and then Hannah. Thank you, Chair. I need to be absolutely clear in my disbelief that government continues to think that tiny flashlights are an excellent gift in all circumstances ranging from burnt out medical workers to seniors who are in the recovery from a hurricane. I need to be very clear on that. This was not a tiny flashlight moment. And I also need to be very clear on the fact that I feel you are misleading committee when you are blurring timelines. Ground search and rescue wasn't deployed until day seven and you know it, mm -hmm. and we know it. But when you're saying people were out and knocking on doors, you're making it sound like that happened in the beginning and you know it did not. You're saying food was delivered, it was not delivered in the beginning and you know it. I feel you're misleading the committee and that's a problem. So my question is what we know is in early days, tiny flashlights and garbage bags are what seniors were receiving in seniors housing. They were sitting in the dark, they didn't have any food, they were scared. This was not a tiny flashlight moment. I would like to know why in those early days, the care packages that went out didn't include food, didn't include blankets, didn't include emergency supplies, emergency lighting in those dark hallways. That are, those are government buildings. You knew the state of them. Is a question, is, Lynn? Sorry. Go ahead. Tell me why that was not part of the original care package and if it will be going forward. And let's be straight, because you know what went out and on what timeline, and so do I. So let's not do this. <laughs> So I guess firstly, uh, like the Monday following the storm, we would have had staff go out to the visit. We would have done door knocks to the facilities. So that, that happened. I agree. Flashlights are not ideal. Ideally, we have a fully functional generator. Unfortunately, that's, that's not the case in a lot of these Charlottetown buildings because, you know, they were built in the 70s, 80s that um, necessarily at the time weren't contemplating the need for a, a fully functional generator due to kind of not experiencing extended power outages. So um, from our perspective as a landlord, like we would have we would have tried our best to provide enough enough to these tenants, um, but we would have worked with our department staff at EMO to try and get them um, some food support, water support, those types of things. So from a landlord perspective, we, we did what we could from a lighting perspective. I know obviously I'm, I'm not disagreeing, flashlights are not ideal, but at the time the uh, generators, we don't have a, we don't have an inventory of, of backup generators that could be deployed. We did eventually, and we're able to secure some through Department of Transportation. Um, from a, I guess from a care packets perspective, we were working with our, our department staff at EMO to try and um, try and identify things that would uh, assist the clients. But I, I recognize that, that flashlights is not not the only thing that we, we could provide. But um, from our perspective as a landlord, we, we were kind of trying to work with, with with EMO to deliver some of those items. And it did happen. It, it probably doesn't, it didn't happen probably Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. But towards the end of the week, food, food was coordinated through EMO. Thank, thank you. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. Um, 
thank you, Chair. I have a lot more questions on that, but I will let it go because I know I only have two. The other thing I need to touch on, let's talk about the Red Cross delivery of this program, the $250. What we know is there were people who waited in line for hours. What we know is people called in and said, I have mobility issues, and the answer was too bad. If you can't wait in line, you're not getting the money. What we know is that there were soft credit checks done on people. So I would like to know if, from your perspective, the Red Cross fulfilled the terms of the contract that you laid out with them. So the terms of the contract that we had were that uh, individuals were to be eligible for the funding based on the fact they made an application, they were validated within the Red Cross uh, emergency system, and that they were residents of TEI. And so based on those three things, then they were to be made eligible for, for, uh, for funding. Uh, so. Um, uh, Red Cross was to stand up a call center to, uh, to reception calls. They had a website to reception applications, and they were to operate uh, sites uh, where people would be able to, to get in. Uh, some of the site access were limited in terms of, uh, I believe that some of their health and safety advice they had kind of indicated that there were some limitations based on the size of the spaces they were able to access, uh, limited some of the capacity for individuals to make their way through those sites on any given day. Uh, my understanding, I believe, is that th that capacity may be close to doubling this week, um, or sort of going forward. Um, so it's unfortunate that uh, people did call in and were informed that it was too bad uh, that they had a disability and that they should have been treated better. Uh, circumstances where we were aware, to, aware of those kinds of comments, we did forward concerns off to the Red Cross to indicate that that messaging was inappropriate. The Red Cross did add some possibility of Zoom conferencing, which for some of the folks that were maybe elderly and experiencing disabilities may not be able to access. Uh, we did offer multiple times to uh, provide alternate assistance uh, in terms of uh, helping Red Cross validate some of their files. Uh, we did receive a number of, I'll we'll call them escalations, that came in from the Premier's office, the Minister's office, the Legislative Assembly, I believe that a number of MLAs also forwarded the items through. Uh, we did our best to work with any of those. So if uh, information was fed, fed back to, to you folks and you made us aware of it, then we did our best to make sure that Red Cross is aware of what the issue was uh, in terms of somebody was provided with bad, bad information or bad advice. And uh, we did our best to, to serve those folks. In those circumstances where we did receive escalations, I believe in most, many of the circumstances, the clients were contacted directly. Uh, by government staff, and uh, their updated information was provided onto Red Cross directly. Thank you. Hannah, two questions, and then I have three, and then we're pretty much finished for today. I would suggest, Chair, that you might need to think about having these witnesses come back. Um, Pat, can, Patrick, can you clearly <coughs> outline the parameters that government set on allocating out that $250. What so, were the parameters that you set to guide the Red Cross? So the three so the three criteria were the criteria that I mentioned. They're listed they're in the contract. So the, the the person needed to make an application to the Red Cross. They needed to have their they needed to be authenticated or validated within the Red Cross system. And they needed to be a Prince Edward I like they needed to have a primary resident or be a primary resident on PEI. And it was based on a per household <coughs> application. Those were the those were the criteria under which the Red Cross is working. And then the reason I'm asking, and this isn't another question, Chair, it's a comment. The reason I'm asking is just because there's just such discrepancy between, you know, the initial applications when people applied they would then, and the money arrived in their bank account 48 hours later to the people that are lining up today. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is a huge discrepancy among people who are the ones that need it the most. The people that are lining up are seniors and vulnerable populations, people who don't pass credit checks, who don't have. So that background, and it's just it's 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 really difficult to try and understand that to be able to explain it to anybody else. I can't get my head around why this is so hard. So the, can <laughs> so the so the so so as of today, so there were about fifty nine thousand applications that have rolled through. There's approximately fifty five thousand approvals have gone out. So and that's within one month. Uh, so in terms of your question, so in terms of the credit check, there's not really. So the credit check was not, my understanding was the credit check was not to validate credit, but was to validate the address at which the, the client, the person was living. And Last, oops, sorry. Go ahead. 
I was just going to yeah. say last. Uh, I will, I'll talk to the Red Cross about that this afternoon and about that process because there are lots of questions about that and how, how that works. Uh, I'm going to circle back to the seniors' housing. I'm afraid I can't let that go either. I, I, it's um, Jason, you're a slumlord. You own 1,600 properties, and they are a disaster, and we've been telling you for five years. We've been telling you for five years that they are not fit for human habitation, and this is the result. And That's your people may have gone out and checked on those properties, but walking in to see whether the walls are still standing is not checking on the residents. <coughs> And the people that fed them were the community. They weren't you. They weren't your department. And honestly, when we were going door to door in the one in my, in my district, I fully expected to find somebody dead. We had people with food poisoning because they had been locked in their apartment for days and they ate the food that had gone off in their fridge. You don't treat dogs like this. And we don't treat our vulnerable people like this. And you should be ashamed. I am so angry, Chair that we are sitting in here trying to be polite about how we treated our vulnerable population. What is wrong with us? It is not okay. And there is no question. I am ashamed. And we need to do better. That's it. That's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate, appreciate everybody coming in um, and, and all, our, all our members for asking important questions. This is a um, a difficult time. I just, I, I, have a, I have a few questions. Based on today's presentation, this is the question that I'm getting in the public, and, and I just want your, your opinion on it really quickly, is that what I'm getting is people are asking me, should we, when we have, we have 200 years trees go down, we have fires happen, we have, uh, our, our society was changed, should we have called a state of emergency? Or, sorry, should we have, should we have taken it to the highest level possible? in Prince Edward Island. I just want your opinion on that. So state of emergency, I, and I know I've, I, I, I sound a bit repetitive in the process, is really to, to give us authority to do something that we don't have authority to do. So I always have to go back and ask the question, what, what were you wanting or what, would, what were we needing to do that we couldn't do, that a state of emergency would have changed? It would not, a state of emergency would not have gotten the power back on any quicker. And, and that's what we needed. Um, you know, Maritime Electric would say, is we asked them, well, you know, what do you need? And they said, we need time. We need time uh, to be able to safely work through all the, the mangle uh, and entanglement of trees and lines, uh, and we have to do it in a safe way, and it takes time. Um, so, you know, we asked ourselves that same question every day, is, is today the day? Um, you know, when we were talking fuel and asking ourselves is, should we be declaring a state of emergency? But it was to do something. To rash, should we be rationing fuel? Um, so we always, it's a bit of a tricky balance, like a lot of other things, is trying to figure out because any state of emergency would further um, impede or put restrictions on individuals. So we're trying to balance, you know, it would be, well, we're going to declare a state of emergency and force you to stay home. Now you can't move. Now you can't go anywhere. Um, so we, we navigate that, and we did it every single day. Should we be asking? Should we be doing it? Yeah. And it's it's good it's a good question because that's the question that I get so people yeah. want to want to know this so I, question, I, yes. I appreciate that and um, in the Callion report which I'm looking at right here and the, the the first finding says some departments do not have the human resource resource capacity to support sustained operations for a prolonged event and that was after Dorian. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say, developing and maintaining an interdepartmental emergency reserve roster of qualified personnel is the most effective way to address the human resource needs. I want to compliment some of the, the housing staff for coming in to various buildings. But upon talking to them and others is that we didn't have the resources to support all the housing units. I know their, their hearts and, the, and they, did, they did everything they had to. Should we have come together? Shouldn't everybody have been a housing officer at that time? Shouldn't we have been pulling people from different sections to make sure that we made the most vulnerable people whole? And did we follow that recommendation looking back? 
And if I look at Cali, and, um, that report again was very focused on EMO operations. It wasn't uh, holistically for all of government departments. So I think again, from a, a, a Fiona one, that is absolutely something we could, we should be asking ourselves. Uh, but that specific point was for EMO staff operations and the and the DSOs that came in. And I think we did a much better job than we did in Dorian. Uh, we had about 12 staff from other departments come in and surge into our office within the first 24 hours that we wouldn't have had in Dorian. So that is a very specific reference to EMO operations. Well, the Calion Report's terms of reference is not appropriate for what happened to us. Yeah. And that's oh, the problem. Yeah. So it I mean, to, yeah. we, 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 can, we can look internal to government, but this hit Islanders. and. Anyway, so uh, the last question I have are, um, you know, uh, there's there's two parts. I, I was talking to, um, you know, Trevor James, who's a disaster management specialist. Nova Scotia asked for his services to come over, but did we effectively um, utilize uh, somebody who's got such an expertise in Prince Edward Island? And as well, that's number one. The last one is, uh, can we loop MLAs into what's happening more effectively in the future um, because we know our districts and I don't know if that was if that's a gap um, you know me as an MLA I was going to to maritime elected to see what I could do to help out people but it would did we miss a coordination piece so two of those last questions there and I'm finished so certainly I think that the question about uh, Trevor Jane Dr. Jane um, is kind of similar to what um, um, was already asked about the disaster management specialists and actually um, I have Dr. Jane coming in with his students uh, into our office next week to do a presentation. Um, so I, I don't know how they were utilized in Nova Scotia. Um, again, I would, uh, if, if Dr. Jane came into our office or any of those, that expertise, I would be literally handing them to, over to Health PEI and say, you guys do your thing. Uh, just tell me what you need yeah. in order to make sure loops are coordinated. So, um, again, I can't speak to what health PEI and how they may have leveraged that piece. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, 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 the MLAs, were, were, the ML, were, were there? And, and I think that's, again, part of, um, in the after action, we need to, and can highlight that, is what are other ways we can get uh, eyes on the ground? Because in our space, we're we're four, four walls that don't even look out to the outside and we can't see. So we have in the past yeah. used many of our partner agencies, yeah. but maybe that's another one that we should be considering to the points that I've heard today. Uh, many of you were out there in the community and could provide um, kind of a report in whatever that looks like. Yeah. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. This, this is a tough meeting, but it's a very, very important one. So um, we've got a lot here to... Uh, to digest as a committee, but um, your time here was was very well served. So thank you very much. It was it was a long meeting, but we appreciate you coming in. So um, before I uh, before I let the guests go, because we're 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 trying to get off air and be back, um, we're going to try to start at ten after one, quarter after one. Will be it. So I would like the MLAs to pick that. It will be be here at ten after. Uh, they they need an hour break to reset the system. Um, it's just uh, internal because we've been on the air for three hours. That's the maximum limit, I do believe. I can clarify. Just for our broadcast team, there's duties that are associated with wrapping up the meeting that take about 20 to 30 minutes. And then same, to start a new meeting, it's about 20 to 30 minute time frame to get that <coughs> meeting online. Mm -hmm. um, we have... I do have new business, but I can bring it forward this afternoon. Do you want to do that? I can bring it back later. For time's sake, I can bring it forward this afternoon. Okay. Was, would everybody okay if we move... New business would be this afternoon, and as well as number five, if we can get there. The, the clerk and I have talked about that before. Um, so, if, if that's okay, uh, could I get a motion to adjourn this meeting, uh, Carla Bernard? So, we'll see everybody back. MLA's back at uh, 10 after and start at, at quarter after. Thank you.